Good evening. I'd like to welcome you, welcome you to the Wednesday, July 13th, 2022, regular meeting of the uh, Palm Springs Planning Commission. Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Elian. I'm here. Commissioner Irvin. Here. Commissioner Hertzstein. Here. Commissioner Miller. Here. Commissioner Marozzi. Here. Vice Chair Roberts. Present. Chair Wilmick. Present. Seven members present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Can I have a report on the posting of the agenda? Madam Chair and Planning Commissioners, our agenda was posted on Thursday, July 7th. Our meeting has been posted in accordance with state law and city policy. Uh, can I have a motion to accept the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion uh, passes. We are in public comments. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on consent calendar and other agenda items and items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the commission. Please note the Planning Commission is prohibited from taking action on items not listed on the posted agenda. Three minutes will be allowed for each speaker. Testimony for public hearing items may be offered at this time and the time of the hearing. The two public hearing items are Walmart Stores Inc. and New Church 2 LLC. Members of the public who would like to comment on items 4A and 5A are directed to comment under this portion of the agenda. That is um, AO Taurus Construction and O2 Architecture. Um, are there members of the public who would like to speak? Mr. Bergman has his hand up. If you wish to speak, please uh, begin. I see you're unmuted. Robert Bergman. Doesn't appear we have any speakers at this time, Madam Chair. We, we have no speakers. Thank you. It's a public hearing or the public comments are closed. The next item is there is no consent calendar tonight. Um, public hearings, uh, 2A Walmart, Walmart Stores Inc. owner for a major development permit application and conditional use permit application for the construction of a fuel station and convenience store located at 5601 East Ramon Road. Can we have a staff report, please? Yes. Everyone can see the screen? No. No? No. No. Okay. Let me try this again. How about now? Yes, thank you. Okay. No problem. All righty. Good evening, Chair and Commission members. Um, like that was just mentioned, Walmart is proposing a 16 pump fuel station within the Destination Ramon Shopping Center adjacent to the existing Walmart shopping center with frontage on Lawrence Crossley Road. Accessory to the fuel station is a 1400 square foot convenience store um, with the request of a type 40 liquor license. The screen, um, sorry, the photo on the left shows uh, overall um, aerial of the Destination Ramon shopping center and the close up on the right shows the project site. Um, they are only proposing to build in what is highlighted. The remainder of the site is to be left untouched. Here's their um, aerial that they provided as well for context. Um, so this is their site plan. The site plan shows the eight, sorry, 16 pump fuel station under a 17 foot high canopy that is approximately 4,000 square feet in size. 
Um, the convenience store is located to the south of the lot. Um, there are two entrances to the site that take place um, from within the interior parking lot and three exits. The exit on the north is a right turn only. Uh, so they'll be directed towards Crossley Road to avoid any buildup in that area, any traffic buildup in that area. The applicant is proposing underground fuel tanks um, close to, uh, on the, sorry, on the east property line, close to Crossley Road and additional parking and landscape and a trash enclosure to the north. Here's just a detail of the proposed trash enclosure. It does meet the standards in our zoning code. Um, one thing I'd also like to add is on the site plan, it does indicate two trash bins. However, after speaking to the applicant, um, this trash enclosure will be able to house three bins, one for regular trash, one for recycle, and one for the green waste per the new state law. Um, so this is a proposed convenience store. Uh, the store is about 14 to 16 feet in height, is single story, and is painted to match the original Walmart building. Um, the applicant is requesting a type 20 uh, liquor license for the sale of beer and wine, um, but would also sell, um, in addition to that, uh, typical gas station type snacks and groceries and food. Um, you said type 40 before and I, I oh sorry type 20. Okay. I did say type 40, it's a type 20. And the license the liquor license isn't in front of us or it is? It is. Um sorry, so this rendering um isn't this is the proposed, this is the rendering of the proposed uh, convenience store. You can see that there's an ice machine and two magazine racks. The applicant is agreeable to removing those completely um, because they should not be out there. Um, here's just a example, oh, I'm sorry, the proposed floor plan. So you have an idea of what the layout I'm will sorry, be. Can, can you back up about what should be removed because it shouldn't be there? Oh, I'm sorry. So. For aesthetic purposes, the ice machine and the two magazine racks, those gray. So they will not be there to fully disregard Correct. those? Correct. So the applicant is uh, uh, agreeable to having those completely removed. They're just agreeable or is intending to not have them there? Um, well, we could talk to him at the end, but I had hmm. discussed in, in if it, you prefer not to have them there, he'll take them out. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. No problem. We've got the floor plan. Um, so this is the proposed canopy. It is about 17 feet, eight inches tall. It would be painted um, mostly white with those gray um, arrows and a small portion with the blue Walmart, the Walmart blue logo um, on the north elevation only. There's just a rendering a perspective standing kind of in the flower bed off Crossley Road. And this is standing um, in the street of Crossley Road, Lawrence Crossley Road. So can you, can you stay with that for a minute? On the yes. on the side plan, it said there was a three foot berm, but this looks like it's on grade up to the wall. Right. So the berm, I don't, can you see the mouse? Yeah. Okay. So that is actually the berm, the darker portion right here. Oh, I thought that was the wall. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's, that's the berm. And if we flip to the landscape plan, the berm doesn't cover the entire um, uh, east property line. It kind of starts two thirds. It covers two thirds of the of the that site, uh, elevation. So this is where the berm is located. Sorry. Um, this is a proposed landscape plan. They are removing some landscape, um, but they are also keeping a majority of it because there's good landscape there and proposing some trees and new landscape around um, the convenience store. Um, just for context of so the proposed berm, this is the site, this is the, where the berm will be located, and this is the detail of what the berm, how the berm will be implemented. Uh, 
The applicant provided a photometric plan as seen on the left. On the right is just a blown up uh, portion that shows those black squares are gonna be the new proposed um, 15 feet tall light poles. And the tinier squares under the canopy are the lights, the LED lights for uh, the gas station. Have you discussed with the applicant extending the canopy to the kiosk? I have not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this is their, their, they are altering the, the destination Ramon sign on um, Ramon Road to fit in um, the Walmart fuel station gas prices, but all signage will be um, reviewed through uh, their uh, specific uh, sign program. So they need to go through, they need to amend their current sign program. So this is just to give you an idea of what it's going to look like. The applicant, um, sorry, so staff does approve, recommend approval of the application subject to the conditions of approval. Um, and the applicant is available for any comments or questions. And that concludes my report. Uh, questions of staff? And if you can take this down. Yes. Questions of staff? Uh, Commissioner yes. Hirschbein. Commissioner Hirschbein. Um, are we the last stop or, or does it go to ARC or does it go to council? It will go to ARC after this. But not council? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Scott Miller had his hand up as well. Uh, Commissioner Miller, I did see that. Yes, <laughs> just uh, one or two questions, uh, mostly regarding uh, circulation. Um, Alex, is there a prohibition against an in at least an in driveway off of Crosley or as far as you know, is that a, a, a prohibition or did the applicant not propose a driveway off of Crosley? Um, it was just never proposed, but I think it's preferred that they come in through the <coughs> book to engineering. They come in through the interior lot. Okay. Um, I've, I've got a concern about the exit only onto the internal drive. Um, the way it's configured now, if you look at the site plan, mm -hmm. um, it's not very channelized as an exit to the right only. And I know that's probably what it's intended to be, but because there is no entrance on Crosley, my fear is that people are gonna come in off of Crosley and not bother going into the parking uh, you know, uh, circulation, and they're going to just go into that exit only uh, onto the internal drive. So I think number one, that needs to be channelized better, which is simple to do with, you know, a reoriented curbing and, and angling. And then given that apparently all of the traffic is going to come in and in and out off of this, what is a parking aisle, I think they knew they need to do a better job about reducing some of those parking spaces and um, better sort of, you know. Chair Miller, orienting. are these questions for staff or these appear to be comments? Uh, well, I'm directing this to Alex um, and then the applicant certainly can keep, can, uh, keep this in mind as we get to him. I just think there's some circulation issues here that we need to address. That's that's my comments for staff. Okay. Alex, do you have a response to that? Um, so engineering did review the plans and didn't have um, any issues regarding circulation. Um, they actually, when this originally came to um, planning commission almost a year ago, um, they preferred that exit only, um, and they seem to be fine with. So possibly an answer from engineering. Afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, there, the original track map for the Walmart Center already has approved entrances off of Crosley Lane, and on major thoroughfares and secondaries, 
we don't like to add any additional driveways um, if they have another source of entering and exiting, which has already been established for that track map. So we um, made the suggestion that leaving this little site area here and having a right turn out only. And I, I, I agree with Mr. Miller, it could be channelized a little bit better and maybe signed a little bit better, but it will, it will alleviate some of that traffic in there. Thank you. Mr. Miller, do you have other questions? Uh, no, not with Rick's response. I think that was great. Um, it's a simple thing for them to do is to better channelize it. We can we can hold on to that for conditions later and possibly staff uh, notes that. Commissioner Elayan, you have your hand up. Thank you, Chair. I do have a couple of questions. Um, and my first, let me start with photometrics. I, Looking at the photometrics, I'm concerned that there are some hot spots and some dark spots uh, because there's pretty big range, you know, from the ones and twos up to, you know, 10 and 12 foot candles. But I don't know, is this, is there somebody on staff that typically reviews these at some point to make sure that, um, that the lighting is appropriate and not too bright uh, in areas, or are we supposed to be doing that? That would be staff. We would review that. Okay, so so that will be looked at at some point, or it has been already. All right, we can hold on to that as for as can, issues to pass on to architectural advisory. Okay, Chair C also looks at that, Madam Chair yeah. and uh, Commissioner Lane. You, I didn't hear your response. Oh, I'm sorry. Just sorry. I just want to interject. Uh, just note that ARC does. Um, look at lighting as a part of its review of the project. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question, I, I just really struggle with looking at the landscaping and understanding what's going on because the landscaping plan, which uh, is old, uh, but still it's the landscaping plan that we have, doesn't seem to agree with the renderings, uh, you know, if I look at sheet two, in fact, I think this was the first one uh, that Alex put up. It looks as though there is head-in parking uh, on the, okay, I'm gonna say the uh, uh, east side of the building. There are a couple of stalls and you can see a car there, but that doesn't show up on any of the other drawings. It looks as though they're supposed to be landscaping. And if I look at the uh, landscape plan, it is showing, you know, four to six foot trees on things uh, that don't show up on the renderings, on sheet five and uh, elsewhere. And I'm just, I'm confused as to what might take precedence or which, which I should be looking at. So I clarified that with the um, with the applicant, um, they do want you to focus mainly on the actual landscape plan, not necessarily the rendering. I think the rendering, um, well, the rendering isn't isn't um, accurate. So it would be the landscape plan that we would. So the landscape plan for I'm sorry. Which page? Um, it doesn't have a sheet number. Yeah, it doesn't have a sheet number. It's towards the end, and it's, it's towards the end. I think it's the second page towards February the end. fourth of last year. Next last page, no, three pages. Sheet, sheet five, sheet five. I will say also shows oh. the landscaping as an elevation. And that's wait, wait, wait. but that, that doesn't seem to agree with the other sheets, and that's that's part of why I get this does not sheet five does not agree with the landscape plans. So we can direct that question to the applicant, but when okay. I speak to him, he, he said that um, it's the landscape plan we should be paying. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and you, I, I did have questions about the outdoor display of merchandise, but uh, I think that was answered. And, and then my only other question is, uh, this will use up approximately half of the, the, the parcel that remains undeveloped. Um, what what are permissible uses for the remaining half of it? Um, permissible uses for the remaining would be anything in the M1. A lot of commercial, would, it would cover a general commercial. Okay, and this is, I presume, all owned under the same ownership? 
I believe so. Okay, so maybe the applicant will be able to tell us if they have any uh, future uses mm -hmm. in mind at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions for staff? I have a couple. Um, on the landscape plan along Crosley Road, uh, and I believe it's Lawrence Cross, Lawrence Crosley Road, if they can correct the drawing. Um, do we have the ability to require trees along the berm? Or is that an original landscape plan? I believe if you would like to add trees, you could add the trees. Uh, I would very much like to add shade trees and we can go into that later in, uh, in conditions and comments. The other question, a uh, couple of questions about hours. There were no hours listed in the staff report. Right, so um, in the justification letter, I believe it states it, but I did confirm it's gonna be similar to the, the main Walmart building. I believe it's 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. And then um, is that also true for the liquor license? That is a good question. We could probably ask the applicant to confirm that. And then uh, in a earlier, um, in a city council meeting, uh, our police chief suggested that it was safe to have, uh, when you're selling liquor and in a kiosk situation, to have two staff. Mm -hmm. Are they proposing two staff? Is my understanding that they're only proposing one, one employee? Okay, I think those are all my questions. Anyone else? Commissioner Irvin. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, what um, percentage uh, of alcohol will be sold um, inside of the store? I don't have a percentage for you. That could probably be directed to the applicant, but I did make them aware that we have um, uh, within our zoning ordinance, that they have to comply with that per, uh, that percentage. It, there's, it's stated in, in our zoning code that they can't sell a certain amount. They have to sell it in conjunction with um, like snacks and food items as well. And what is the percentage? And if you don't know, perhaps Mr. Newell does. I don't. Yeah, so the under the new changes that we established with the develop or with the gas station uh, ordinance changes is a maximum of 25% alcohol sales. The rest has to be other food, um, snack, and sundry items. What 25% of what total sales? Correct. Or square footage. Total sales, I believe, but we can confirm. I think. But, but how, how will the city ever monitor that? You'd have to look at their receipts every year or every quarter. I'm yeah, looking. I think our, right. Right. Go ahead, Mr. Priest. Yeah, I'm looking it up right now. Chair, we do have that. It is one of the conditions. It's condition. It is condition A. A. And, <clears throat> and, and yeah. thank you to. Uh, Commissioner Irwin for asking yeah. the question because I had the same question, which is how yeah. how it's limited to 25% uh, by value, but how on earth is that monitored or right. enforced? According to ordinance 2063, which was the recent one, which amended that section of the zoning code, it provides sales of beer, wine, liquor, and other alcoholic beverages from the same location as gasoline and other motor vehicle fuel may be permitted under the following conditions. Such sales must be offered only in conjunction with the secondary retail of food, groceries, and sundries, in which not less than 75% of the value of the retail sales of all products other than gasoline, motor vehicle, uh, comprises sales of products other than beer wine. So by default, it's a 25% of the sales can be beer, wine, liquor, other alcoholic beverages. But it is indexed based off the value of retail sales. That is what the code says. And so, and so how do they, back to what Commissioner Hirschbein said, how do they regulate um, how the sales are made? 
Uh, and how do they know? For practical purposes, I think it would be something that uh, the city would have to, you know, look at the retail sales. It would probably have to be some sort of an investigation that the city did uh, to determine whether uh, that condition, that provision of the code is being uh, complied with or violated. Uh, I agree that another policy di uh, direction the city could have taken was some sort of percentage of gross floor area, but that's not done in the code here. It is a percentage of retail sales. So we'd have to assess that to determine whether a violation exists or not. Could we, uh, could, we could always do a condition on percentage gross floor area though, in addition to that, can, couldn't we? If the planning commission believes that there is some sort of a land use concern that needs to be addressed uh, with a condition of approval in order to make your findings, uh, you can do that. But I would urge the commission to clearly articulate what the land use concern is uh, that the added condition is addressing. Because you'd be going above code. Well, not necessarily. Well, more stringent than code, potentially. Potentially, uh, but not necessarily. Okay. Are there more questions of staff? There being none, the public hearing is open. The applicant has 10 minutes. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Thank you all for uh, hearing our case tonight. This is Jacob Clay's um, project applicant, along with uh, I have uh, we're the civil engineer involved in the project. We also have the architect on, um, so they're happy to answer any questions as well. Should you have any questions regarding that, uh, ultimately happy to be back in front of you all. I, I think, as Alex alluded to earlier, presented a different type of format store to you. Um, I think about nine months ago. Um, unfortunately, that was not acceptable based on your code at the current time. And so was have been able to go back to, <clears throat> excuse me, have been able to go back to Walmart um, in the operations department and present this new um, this new prototype in front of you all. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I think a couple of the questions that were raised um, was the channelization I by uh, Commissioner way one of the commissioners, um, we're happy to work with staff on the, ch the channelization of that. We're happy to add the additional signage. We did work with engineering. We felt that what was presented was sufficient, but if there's additional needs for channelization, I don't see an issue in doing that. Um, one of the other comments was, does Walmart own the site? Walmart does own the site. They currently do not have a, another, I'd say another tenant looking at that piece of property. Um, as you all know, this piece of property on the side has, has sat vacant since Walmart was constructed. I know that staff has been, or the city itself has been trying to get, um, have that parcel filled, but given kind of its tight location has not been able to. So we're excited that fuel will be coming in there. We're hoping that it will kind of revitalize that area, add some additional features to that. And then ultimately we'll try to bring in another um, potential user behind us, um, right behind the fuel station. But at this time, we don't have anybody, but we're hopeful of that. Regarding the ice racks and magazine racks, understand that's per city code, so there's no issue in removing that. Um, and then in terms of the hours, the 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. based on the store, um, we're good with that. And then in terms of the, uh, the sale of alcohol sales, one thing that is gonna be a little bit different in terms of this facility versus another convenience store facility is you have the main Walmart box right down the way. Um, there's a closed circuit TV that connects to both of those, as well as the Walmart security that is actually at the Walmart box. So um, while we will have one staff member at this location, there's always that ability to have the, the security or other folks come in from the Walmart box, given that it's one use. So I try to address most of the questions. I, I probably missed a couple, Chair, but if I did miss any, happy to uh, happy to answer anything. And I would say again, happy to be in front of you all to represent this project. We're hopeful to get constructed and get this out there to fill that kind of that need inside that area. Um, and also thank you to Alex for uh, for working with us on this new application. And again, happy to be here in front of you all. Uh, are there are there members of the public who wish to testify? Mr. Newell, do you have anyone who wishes? No requests to staff, but if there's anyone he, here on the Zoom meeting who wishes to speak, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself. 
Uh, there being none, uh, you have three minutes for rebuttal. Um, I'm assuming you're not going to take that, but would you please stay here for questions from uh, the commission? Yes, ma'am. Are there questions of the applicant? Commissioner Miller. Yeah, I don't know if this is for Jacob or maybe uh, Rick from engineering. Um, uh, Jacob, have you looked at the circulation for the actual oil tanker that's going to drop your fuel? Are they able to make the maneuvers around the canopies and such um, uh, sufficiently? Yes, Commissioner Miller. Um, that was something that we did look at. That's something that Walmart operations, that's their, their number one thing that they look at because if we can't get gas there, we, <laughs> we can't have a fuel station. So that is definitely something. Um, ultimately, we do have sufficient. We ran our truck turn. That was blessed by them. We have a special truck turning template that's Walmart designed and laid out. Um, we ran that through, got blessing from them, and then did present that over to engineering and got blessing from them as well. Okay, thank you. Other questions for the applicant? Commissioner Hirschbein. Uh, going to the percentage of the sales area uh, of liquor, Do, could the architect or anyone on the, your team speak to the percentage of uh, sales area that's devoted to alcoholic beverages current, in the plan currently, merchandising plan? <clears throat> Let me, um, I don't know if I can get the architect on. Let me see if I can, Mr. Hirsch, our council, I'm sorry, Commissioner. Let me do a quick little math real fast so if I can pull that um, and then I can get back to you on that question if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Other questions for the applicant while we're waiting? Uh, had you looked at the canopy, we, I think you, uh, I don't know if you're in the desert today with us on another very, very hot day but people walking uh, from the fuel pumps into the, into the sales area, it's a very hot area. Um, have you looked at adding to the canopy and either, either at the building or bringing the canopy from the fuel station across? Yes, Chair, um, in, terms of, in terms of that, that has been something that has been a, a discussion per se. Um, what we would like to do is to have some, there is a canopy that kind of extends over the, it's shown on the elevations, um, specifically if you looked at the side elevations, there is a canopy that shows over the, the front um, sidewalk per se, um, but there is not one, a canopy that extends all the way over to the extension of the fuel station. And, and honestly, that is more just a, a circulation issue. Um, and the reason being is because I do have to have the tanker truck drive through the site in case there's a fire truck that goes on the site or anything else. I have to be able to provide that, that clear access height um, and providing some type of canopy across the drive aisles as long as the footings and the posts and everything else would be a, a little bit of concern there. So we do not provide it. Um, we do have the shade that's above the front door and we have the shade that's over the canopies, but we don't actually have something that goes from the canopy all the way um, to that, given that kind of that reason. That answers your question, Commissioner Chair. Uh, how how wide is the canopy over the sidewalk, and and what hours will it shade the sidewalk in the entry? Chair, I, in terms of the hours, I I don't. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think I've done that whole study on exactly what the amount of hours were that the the canopy would shade. Um, given the fact that the building, I'm going to kind of go a little bit off here, but given the fact that the building is facing south, um, I assume that you'll probably get some of the morning sun, but anything from the afternoon on, you would not be getting any of that additional sun because of the, the sunset and everything else over the hills. So I assume that anybody that's standing under that canopy um, would most likely, the shade canopy would most likely be getting some of the morning sun, but wouldn't get any of the afternoon sun. Um, that would be my best approximation to answer your question there. In terms of the canopy itself, the width, it, the width will, uh, it matches the sidewalk. So I think it sticks out about six to uh, six ish feet, six to seven feet from the building. Um, but again, I can get that exact number for you. Okay. And the if I can. The entrance actually faces north, it seems to me. 
sorry, yes, the, the building faces north, but getting that, that southern sun, that western exposure from the sunset. Sorry, Commissioner. How, how far is the, uh, the canopy over the pumps, uh, the uh, south edge, I guess that would be, maybe the south edge, over to the building? How far is that? Commissioner, you're talking about the, the path of travel from the pump to the front door? No, the edge of the canopy, the edge of the canopy closest to the building, to the building. The, 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 the pump canopy, the big canopy. The pump, can yeah, so the pump canopy itself, um, it, there's the pump canopy, there's a 35 foot drive aisle, there's a 20 foot parking stall and there's a six foot sidewalk. So are you talking about those dimensions in front of that? I'm talking about the dimension from the edge of the pump canopy to the building. 55 feet. To go back, Ms. or Chair Hersberger, to go back and answer your your other question, if I if I can, um, the freezer cases or the, the the cases themselves, the freezer cases are about twenty three percent of the entire sales area of the of that. I assume that we're not utilizing the entire sales, so I'm going to throw a a number out there, and I I might be a little bit off, but you're probably maybe in the the fifteen percent or something of the entire floor area. Um, but again. We didn't really look at that from that from that standpoint. We did look at it from the city's adopted code standpoint that talked about the percentage. Um, and I'm I'm no alcohol expert by any means, but I assume some of that is regulated by um, regulated by the um, by the state board and their government license. I know that our uh, actually Walmart's land use actually just logged in. So, Brian, if you're okay to answer that, I would I would sincerely appreciate that. Yeah. Uh Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, Brent McManigal with the firm of Fenimore, uh, Council for Walmart. I handle all of their liquor licensing. And we've done one of these other stores in Northern California. And a similar question, it, what I recall on this 1440 is the alcohol area is about 10 to 12 percent um, overall floor area. Um, so not a lot. Um, primarily, they'll take up a couple of the coolers, maybe as half as much as thirty or forty percent of the coolers for beer, um, and then they'll have a couple of racks for the wine. Because here we'll only be selling beer and wine. So, a question for you: Would you be comfortable? Would you be all right accepting a limitation of no more than fifteen percent of the floor area for alcohol, given what you've told us? In the city has its own regulations, and if you're going to apply that kind of standard to everybody, I'm just uh, we don't, we don't want to be singled out. I'm just well, asking, so that's a no. As long as it's uniformly applied to all areas, um, but it seems to me we're setting new precedent, and the city has its recently adopted one. The, so. the ordinance is, is drafted has some problems. That's all I'm saying. So we were looking at that. So, yeah, it, we're not we're not equipped tonight to to agree to that kind of condition. We did agree in our in agreement with the sales limitations. That's in our conditions of approval. Um, Commissioner Maruzzi, you have questions. Mr. McManigal, I think the question, since the ordinance re uh, refers to the percentage of sales. How do you monitor that? You know, Walmart has, I mean, they track all of their sales and they will have to set up a, a program to monitor that. Um, they have very detailed record keeping and um, that's a, one of their compliance issues that uh, we brought to their attention and they didn't have any concerns with it. Would you be, oh, sorry. So someone is going to be specifically monitoring the, the uh, the receipts of this single store? Walmart has, like, they have a monitoring program. They keep track of all of their products. They are aware of this condition and didn't have any concerns with it. <laughs> okay, you said that already. But being aware and actually doing something about it are two different things. So if we added a condition that you would notify the city annually 
of the percentage of sales. And again, if you're going to apply that to everybody, um, then it has to apply to everybody. But we don't want to be singled out that where no one else has to comply or do these same type of uh, restrictions. We understand the condition of approval. And typically with these types of conditions, the city will come in and ask for records. Um, th that's how we've seen it done in the past. I understand that there may be some flaws in the city ordinance. Um, we'd be happy to work with the city on those changes and comply with those in the future as they would apply to anybody else. Madam Chair, what we might do is add a condition under PLN 8 that says the Director of Planning has authority to request um, sales history to determine conformance with this condition at any time. That's that's acceptable. Uh, I was, I'm sorry, I have another question. Go ahead, please. Mr. Priest, do you have any comments about uh, what has been discussed just now? Uh, I believe that the proposal Mr. Newell made is is reasonable and would allow the city to obtain information to verify compliance with the code here. Uh, I believe that you know the the city the planning commission would be entitled to put additional conditions about square floor you know floor area and things like that uh, more restrictive conditions if the commission can articulate a particular land use impact of this application. Otherwise, we really have to defer to the, uh, the main code here applied to everyone. If the commission's concern is that this ordinance needs amendment to perhaps index off a of floor area, we could certainly uh, bring you know, that under consideration. Maybe that would come back to the commission and the council as a code amendment. Would it be would retroactive though? Yeah. It would not be retroactive. This would be going on a going forward basis. This project is evaluated under this current code. And, and that's what we'll do. Thank you. Um, other questions, Commissioner Marutzi? Anybody else? Commissioner Hirschbein. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Priest, uh, this is the first time I've heard an applicant articulate something that a, a condition has to apply to everybody uh, moving forward in every case. Is that a legal position? I uh, guess uh, there's sort of a nuanced answer to this. Generally, code applies across the board to everybody. And that's what the applicant is doing here, complying with this uh, you know, cap in the uh, retail sales. At least that, that's what they're agreeable to that condition. Um, the planning commission has constitutional nexus. And we've talked about this concept before to impose additional conditions if you can identify a specific uh, public health, safety, welfare concern that's not being addressed with this application. Uh, the question we would have here is whether there are particular circumstances here, or if this is really more a concern about how the code is written. If that's the case, then the condition is not the way to address it. It would be a code amendment. It, yeah. Just as a point of, a point, for me, it's a code amendment. We've always addressed percentage of sales before and never percentage of receipts. So it, it's, it's- Sales area, you mean, not sales. Yeah, in, in every other convenience store we've talked about it, it's been percentage of sales area. So this is very new to us to have this yeah. change and I have right. a question about the change. And, and Mr. Priest, with all due respect, I don't think you answered my question. Uh, my question was, can an applicant insist or require that as a condition to agree to our terms, that everybody moving forward has the same condition applied to them? Because that, that was his position. Well, I, I think the, the, the correct statement of the law here is unless there is some special circumstance, some particular public health, safety, welfare impact that's being addressed for that application, the commission may not add additional conditions beyond what code compliance requires. So, you know, for this application, if, if there are no additional concerns that the planning commission can articulate, then they have to comply with code. And you, that, would be, that would be across the board for all applicants. Excuse me, this, you're going into general discussion 
Uh, I haven't closed the public hearing yet. So are there any other questions of the applicant? Well, the applicant is on record. Commissioner Roberts, you had your hand up. He doesn't. Okay, I'm closing the public hearing. Uh, thank you both for um, coming before us. The matter is before the commission. I want to just start, Commissioner Roberts, I, have, I was going to start with a motion uh, outlining the issues that have come before us. Were you going to do something different? Um, then I'm going to do it to see if we can move fairly quickly. Uh, the, I would move approval with some changes, uh, a definition of hours, uh, which is from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. for both sales sales of gas and sales uh, in the um, uh, sales building. Um, that that also includes alcohol. Um, the uh, second condition is that we have we look at the circulation area and look at the channelization and improve that issue that was outlined. Um, we refer to uh, AAC the issue of lighting and that we had some concerns and we would like them to review that. Uh, we we uh, take a position that we want the uh, ice machine and, and sales uh, magazine sales racks removed from the front of the building. Um, we, uh, we, we agree with one staff person as long as there is security backup with uh, Walmart so that an additional person could come over from Walmart if, um, if asked to by the staff that's there if a situation arose that we add to the PLN uh, regarding the percentage of sales that the director has the right to ask for that information from the applicant uh, when they determine they need it. Um, and on uh, with architectural advisory, I would like them to look at the trees on Lawrence Crosley Road. We have been trying to do a canopy of trees every 15 feet of shade trees on principal streets. I'd like them to look at the landscape plan and modify it in that way. I believe that's an issue for architectural advisory. Um, and the other thing is just to look at the shading on the building over the uh, sidewalk to make sure that it's adequate to shade people who are standing in that area given the heat. Is there any other issue that anybody raised that we would want to include in that or does anybody like that motion? Commissioner Lane. Uh, I like the motion a lot. I do have uh, two things I want to clarify or add. Um, one is relative to the shading on the front door. It appears that there's a conflict between trees that are shown on the landscape plan and the uh, canopy. And I would like the solution uh, to not lose number of trees. So if we can make yes. sure that we don't lose trees in that in that final solution. And number two, uh, or uh, additional thing, we do have an erroneous, I believe, reference where one of the conditions is a residential smoke alarms. Um, I presume there's a commercial corollary to that. That is item number seven of the fire department conditions and if staff can uh, correct that before it gets finalized. Otherwise, I would second your motion. Is there discussion on it or other items that we people feel we've missed? Commissioner Marucci. Mr. Priest, uh, one more aspect of this that I try to understand. Since whatever action we would have made, let's say regarding uh, the percentage of sales and so forth, applies only to future applicants, if we had said that, starting with this applicant, uh, we would require them to submit receipts showing the percentage of sales. What, I mean, is, is that, are we making um, 
would that have to be codified in some way or can we do that and then henceforth you know we'll apply that to everybody well my understanding of the condition commissioner was that uh, the director of planning services has the authority to request that information of the applicant to verify compliance. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's the wording of the uh, condition. And we can do that to verify compliance. That's not a problem. I think that's consistent with the code. Where I would have some concerns is if the commission started imposing greater substantive requirements than the code requires without articulating, again, a particular land use impact that this project brings that necessitates that higher or more stringent condition than what code requires. Uh, but for purposes of just verifying compliance with the code, yeah, we're, we're within our rights to condition it to say, we can ask for that information and you need to produce it. That's, that's really not what I'm saying. I don't expect the director of planning to remember every year that he needs to ask Walmart for their receipts. Um, if it was required that the app, that the that Walmart do it or the app, the business do that, then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't fall upon staff. So it's not exactly the same. Okay, uh, well, if the commission wants to amend that condition and say that Walmart shall on an annual basis or on, on a per periodic basis shall provide you know, documentation to show compliance, I think they can do that. Uh, the commission is authorized to do that. That would be uh, implementing, enforcing the code. That's the way I would look at it too. And I would like to make that amendment to the um, motion. It's acceptable to me. Commissioner Elaine. You're, I think you're muted. Uh, I have no comment. Commissioner. And, and as related to that, perhaps we could say specifically, it will be sent to the director of planning. I mean, there, there'll be a, a, someone that the information will go to directly, or do we just say staff? I'll defer to uh, Mr. Newell on how he would prefer that to be routed. Yeah, I think director of planning is, is adequate. Uh, that way it gets to the proper location. Commissioner Roberts, Vice Chair Roberts. Excuse me, thank you. Um, I never heard the applicant ask to have the code rewritten based on rules that we were asking of him. What I heard was the ask, applicant simply asking to simply follow the code that exists today and not be singled out and have his code changed specifically for him. The city already has obviously some way of monitoring these percentages or they don't. But I think that for us to sit and rewrite all this, including monitoring for this specific applicant doesn't make any sense. If we as a commission want to start rewriting codes about alcohol percentages, that's another whole subject. But I think we're putting a specific applicant through the ringer right now for no reason. He's simply coming in on the city code at it as it is written today. And frankly, I think we're wasting a tremendous amount of time and going down a rabbit hole on something that we can certainly look at, but not while an applicant is sitting here in the room being picked on specifically. I have a response to that. This was a major issue for us when we were considering the tower market in the north end of town, this issue of percentage of alcohol sales, a major issue. And that's why I'm bringing it up. And that's why Mr. Urban, I believe, brought it up. It's not just because we're trying to pick I on understand. the app, not that we're trying to pick on the applicant. And well, to do it, ask, the applicant doesn't make sense. Pete, if you want to go after percentages and you want to go after the code and you want to go after the city's monitoring, that is an issue unto itself. To pick it up every time we have an applicant come in with alcohol sales doesn't make any sense. It's not, we're not treating people evenly, and that's not our job. Okay, I, I would defer to our attorney. And if he says that it's, it was acceptable, I would defer to him. Let's, uh, we had Commissioner Miller responding, and then we, we had a suggestion of making changes, and we've got a, a maker of the motion and a seconder. So Commissioner Thank Miller, then Commissioner Irvin. Thank you. Thank you. I agree wholeheartedly with Vice Chair Roberts. I don't think we should be singling out this applicant, this application. Everything on this application looks like a standard convenience smart attached to a gas station. 
We've got the ability as a city to monitor gross receipts if we need to. We've had that introduced as, a, as an addition to PLN 8. I see no reason to belabor this issue anymore. There's nothing that would indicate that this is a liquor store as opposed to a convenience mart. Um, and so I'm ready to move on. Uh, well, we have Commissioner Irvin with his hand raised. So uh, you, you have the floor. Yeah, and, and, and I would just like to say, um, if we continually keep having the same discussion, then when are we going to address it and deal with it? Um, that, that, that's where I am with it. I mean, because, you know, it, we also had a 7-Eleven uh, as well um, market that had the same and similar issue. Um, I thought we worked out something to where we were creating an ordinance or, or created something to be able to deal with this. Um, but 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 like like the other uh, two have said, uh, you know, I understand what you guys are saying. It's not fair to the applicant, um, but maybe we can put something to where we discuss it and, and deal with it going forward. Uh, we can take that up at the end of the meeting and not here. Uh, I'm not going to uh, accept a change to the motion. Commissioner Lyon. I stand behind the motion without the addition. Can so, somebody please restate the motion because I'm completely confused now. If staff can do it or I can do it, one or the other. I, I'm, I've got it all written down, uh, Madam Chair, if you'd like me to restate it. Uh, whoever made the motion, can that person please restate their motion with conditions so we know what we're voting on? I made the motion. Um, it would be good if you followed it, but I would rather staff. I followed it. It just changed. I, I asked staff to restate it. Thank you. So the motion on the floor is to approve the subject application subject to the conditions in the report, as well as some additional conditions. Number one, relative to the hours, adding the operational hours as a condition from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., Number two, to improve circulation and channelization exit on the north side of the project. Number three, um, and this incorporates some other that were said towards the end of the motion. Number three, ARC to review lighting, um, particularly under the canopy, trees along the street, shading and shading in front of the building and solar control in front of the building. Uh, number four, remove the sales um, uh, vending cart or uh, displays in front of the store. Number five, the kiosk may have one person attendant um, to operate the business as, so long as there is an additional backup person or security um, attendant that can respond if there are issues. Number See, the next one is number six. Um, the director may request proof of compliance with sales of alcohol conditions in PLN 8 at any time. Number seven, the, the applicant is to ensure trees are not removed from the plan when addressing the shade structure or adding shade structures to the, to the kiosk. And then finally, um, address fire condition number seven relative to residential structures before finalizing the resolution. Can I ask the maker of the motion? I think uh, it was item number six that I think uh, we were trying to delete from the motion and the second that, re that required additional um, submittal of sales of alcohol records to the director. No, we actually, we allowed the director to have to request that information as he, as he deemed fit. Okay, that's on request. Okay. On request. And that will be a standard condition, I hope, going forward with these. Does anybody have any additional concerns regarding the motion before I call the, uh, I have the roll called. Seeing none, would you call the roll, please? Chairwoman? Yes, aye. Commissioner Leon? Yes. Commissioner Irvin? Yes. 
Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Maruzzi? Yes. Vice Chair Roberts? Yes. Motion uh, carries seven zero. Good luck to you, and I look forward to seeing um, or actually utilizing your gas station once it's built. It's very close to me. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you. Okay, the next issue before us is 2B, New Church 2 LLC, for a two year extension of time for entitlements involving major architectural application and conditional use permit to one to renovate two historic properties for an adaptive reuse and demolish and reconstruct one, two, one and two story structures on a 3.6 acre site for the operation of a hotel with accessory spa restaurant and meeting space located at 222 South Cahila Road, zone R3. Staff report, please. Yeah, Chair, well, uh, Chair, before we proceed with the staff report, I'd like to note for the record that my residence is located within 300 feet of the project, and therefore I'm going to be accusing myself, turning off my camera, and I will rejoin you when we get to the next item. Thank you. Staff report, please. Madam Chair and Planning Commissioners, the request before you is an extension of time of entitlements related to the Orchard Tree Project, which is a property that is bound by Cahuilla Road to the west, Andreas, excuse me, Arenas Road to the north, Bellardo Road to the east, and Baristo Road to the south. It encompasses two historic Class One properties, uh, as well as um, the remainder of the site that you see here on the screen. Uh, it is roughly 3.6 acres in size, will contain 74 rooms, a restaurant, spa, and meeting space. So the site plan that you have here is what was approved back in May of 2020. And the renderings here on the screen give you a flavor of what was uh, shown as a part of the approval back in 2020. So the entitlements that were required for this project involved a major architectural application for the construction of the new hotel buildings, conditional use permit for the accessory commercial spaces, the restaurant, the spa, uh, restaurant and spa areas. It also involved a general plan amendment to reclassify Arenas Road. Um, and so that was downgraded uh, to um, another class so that uh, it didn't require uh, right of way along this frontage, as well as properties to the west, which are already established. The project also required a variance to reduce setbacks along Berlato and Baristo Road frontages down to 11 feet. And it also involved certificates of appropriateness for the two class one historic sites and um, uh, requests to not issue a stay of demolition for the other structures, which were considered class four structures. Um, so, excuse me, sorry. Um, the applicant has, uh, as a part of this um, time extension request, identified some changes to the project at the request of the uh, hotel operator. Um, two primary areas to the project site are being are proposed. There are proposed changes to, um, relative to the church, the historic church property. There is a proposed addition of the spa on the second level, which is roughly a thousand square feet in size. They're locate, locating the transformer and electrical equipment on the south side of the church and adding a trash enclosure near that area as well. Can you show that to us? Yeah, I'm gonna go through these on the, on the plans here in just a second. Oh, okay. And then uh, lastly, on this property, they're adding a open air patio bar within the dining area. Um, which is near the southeast area of the dining area. And then there's a building at the southeast corner of um, Arenas and Kauia. 
and uh, they're proposing to relocate two rooms on within the ground floor to the upper floor of that building. It was originally a one-story building. So when looking at the church property, you see here on the, in the yellow highlighted area, this is where the church is located on Kowea and Barista Road. Um, and this is really just a kind of a zoomed in view of the church uh, property. Uh, and so looking at where the changes are on um, kind of the south side of the building along Barista Road, you see the proposed outdoor bar space um, along uh, that front of <coughs> here. They had, um, we identified a proposed restroom building just south of that, or excuse me, east of that in front of the building, but we've identified that that is an issue relative to the setbacks. Uh, so they have chosen to delete that, and that's that's shown in this these, this box here, or this rectangle here. So that's that will be removed from the final plans because of an issue with setbacks. Um, but that was that noted in your report, but it's also noted as being deleted. It will be deleted from the plan. What so was is, where the outdoor bar was before? Uh, I don't think they had an outdoor bar. This was all restaurant dining areas, and so now they're proposing a permanent open air bar area. Okay, thank you. And they're proposing the transformer in this location and they indicate that that is based on what is required from the utility agencies. And then lastly, on this side of the property, they're showing the expanded um, trash enclosure area here. And so when you look at this, oh, before I move on to the, um, the elevations, the other area that's changing on the project is the spa addition on the second floor. The Siegel is located here in the center of the property. Uh, so it's further north from that over on this area. And I'll show those to you in elevation view. Um, so when looking at the elevation view on the south side of the project fronting Barista Road, the top exhibit here is what was reviewed and approved back in um, 2020. And so you can see that the changes that are highlighted or surrounded in red are where you are seeing the changes in elevation view. So the two-story or the spa addition is located here, and then the spa or the, the trash enclosure is over in this location, which is was shown here. So they're building they're building onto the church. It's not just moving something to the second floor. No, it's an addition. Thank you. When looking at the west elevation um, of the property fronting Kawea Road, here is where you see the addition occurring. And so I've highlighted it here uh, with this rectangle. So again, the steeple is over here um, and the addition is located over on this area. When looking at the east side of the property, so the elevation facing the bungalows, the addition is really um, apparent in this location. And uh, you see there is actually a slight increase in height from what was shown previously in the approved elevation. Um, on that one, David, that shows some more articulation on the approved drawing to the right. Is that just left off the new drawing or are they actually removing that articulation? You know, I think that's just to show where the existing um, arches are. In, and to the right of that. In this, oh, over here? Yeah. Yeah, I believe that is being removed, but the applicant should be able to confirm that. And then moving on to the building at Arenas and Kawea. Um, this is the southeast corner of that intersection. This was originally proposed as a one-story building. Um, so in the floor plan, you see they had seven units on the left. And on the right, what they're proposing is the ground floor to have five units and then uh, two units on the second floor. In terms of the elevation view along um, the street, this would be the view along um, Kawea on the top and then the proposed view on the bottom. So as, as I noted, it is increasing to a second story. Can you explain why so far along into the project, 
the applicant is coming back with these changes? In conversations I've had with the applicant, it's because the operator has requested these changes, but I'll let him confirm that. Because this, they should be at full working drawings submitted to the city, correct? Correct. So the, the drawings for the original are already in the city? The, um, yes, they've submitted construction permits. With these changes? With these changes. So the construction permits are with these changes or without them? With these changes. And when were those submitted and? Um, they were submitted as required by the covenant agreement. So if I pull up the milestones on that, I could submit that. On March 1st? No, we submitted that on June 15th. And does submitting changes, I'm just, I'm just asking questions. Does submitting changes with the application meet the requirements that city council had for uh, substantially complete construction documents? Um, and that's really kind of a separate issue, whether or not the, the plans that were submitted were complete, you know, in terms of industry standards. Um, this is more relative to a change or a revision to the approval. Um, so potentially they could have submitted it without this change and had and still complied, but they're submitting it with this change and still comply and trying to comply with that um, milestone. Thank you. So in terms of the findings that are required to be made for a time extension, there are seven criteria that must be evaluated when approving a time extension. These are listed here, that the project is consistent with the city's general plan. There's appropriate, uh, the project remains appropriate for the original, there's a appropriateness and validity of the original findings in terms of the project applications. Are they, you know, are they still relevant for the project? Um, has there been environmental changes in the site's surroundings? Um, are there uh, conformance to property maintenance standards? Has the applicant demonstrated convincingly and clearly that the project will be underway within the time frame requested? And have they made reasonable, substantial, and timely efforts to um, begin construction? And finally, have there extenuating circumstances that are not within the applicant's control that have caused the delays? So those are um, the findings that are required. Staff has presented um, recommended responses for complying with the time extension. Um, we do uh, recommend one year in terms of the um, extension. The applicant has requested two years. You know, the one unique, well, one of the unique things with this project is there is a TOT rebate um, covenant agreement that was established between the applicant and the um, the city. The original agreement was improved was approved in 2019. They did the council did amend that agreement October of last year, and they did establish a performance schedule. In terms of what we look at when we evaluated that um, covenant agreement and what the applicant has done. Uh, relative to the land use approvals that are granted and the time extension really that, that is of um, relevance here is you know what improvements or changes have occurred on the property. Um, have they submitted the, the materials in, uh, in good faith as required relative to construction? Um, and at what point will the permit be issued? So, and effectively making the entitlement exercise so in this case, um, we've identified that they have installed additional fencing to secure the property. They haven't uh, identified that they do have um, security on site. Um, they have demolished buildings as required in the uh, performance schedule. And they've um, prepared the construction drawings, the permit drawings, and submitted those to the city as required. Um, by June 15th. 
Um, and so when we looked at what would be a, the appropriate time frame based on the just the agreement alone, um, regardless if this uh, you know, if they comply or not, um, was how long would it take before the permits issued? And so under, I think we identified in the staff report, October 15th was the deadline to get um, that, uh, to get the construction drawings approved, um, which is the case. But in fact, they are not required to be issued and really uh, effectively exercising the entitlements until January of, uh, I say January of 2022. I, it's, that's an error. It's actually January of 2023. Um, so in our recommendation to you, we suggest a one-year extension um, as opposed to the requested two years. Can you explain what the one year is from when to when? So um, the one year would occur from uh, the date at which the entitlement was originally set to expire, which was May of May 7th of this year. Um, so it's effectively being told until this decision is made on the time extension. Um, but it would be one year from May 7th of this year to May 7th of next year. Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, is that the end of your report? Are there questions of staff? Uh, I'm assuming there will be several. Uh, Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Roberts and then Commissioner Hirschbein. Thank you. Mr. Newell, so from what I can see and what you're saying, what you're looking for tonight is simply an extension? Correct. Okay, thank you. So we're not opening up the project. We're not redrawing it. We're not unraveling it. It's simply an extension up or down, correct? So the request before you is an extension. We have identified changes that the applicant is requesting. We wanted to make sure the commission was aware of that because one of the criteria that is required um, to be, you have, that the commission has to find is relative to the project changes. So um, if the commission feels that those changes are not minor or not um, insignificant to the overall project, then that would essentially be, we would reject those changes and we would have to build it per the original approval. Um, if you chose to approve the extension this evening and um, reject those changes. So it's, Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, Commissioner Hirschbein? Could we approve the extension, but not approve the changes? That is something the commission could do. And as far as the um, construction documents that were submitted to the city, uh, were civil uh, drawings submitted? They have submitted civil drawings to the city. And electrical? Um, I'm not sure on the electrical. Mechanical? The city engineer could answer those questions. Good afternoon. <clears throat> um, the submittals that were made to engineering um, were some grading plans that were roughly 50%, maybe, um, complete, and a water quality management plan. Um, that's all that was submitted to the city this week. Um, but it has not gone into plan check because it did not um, pay for the plan check fee. But all of the other civil documents have not been submitted, and there's quite a few. So, so there's been no civil drawings uh, submitted to plan check because of the fee? Correct. And what about electrical and mechanical? That would be through the building department, and I don't know if they're here with us tonight. Okay. Mr. Newell, can you answer that question? What I can try and do is locate um, the permit records and see if that information uh, is available. Are there other, other questions, Commissioner Hirschbein? No. Uh, Commissioner Maruzzi and then uh, Vice Chair Roberts. Yes, uh, Mr. Newell, Has, have the requested changes, alterations been presented to the Historic Site Preservation Board for their comment? and or approval? Um, so part of the conditions of approval for the project were that certain items go back to the HSPB. The applicant has submitted um, an, a historical assessment of the project impacts relative to the historic resources. So we are evaluating that document now. Um, and so 
at, once we conclude our analysis and evaluation of that um, report, we will present that to the HSPB. But won't that be too late since we would have already approved, potentially approved the changes? So the, so the changes would still be subject to a certificate of appropriateness from the HSPB, even if the Planning Commission approved the requested changes. And would this package go to City Council as one, or would the extension be broken out from that? Um, it, the extension would probably be broken out separately because the certificate of appropriateness is not ready for HSPB review yet. Oh. Hmm. Vice Chair Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Newell. Um, I didn't follow you. Is this project or application currently in compliance with respect to security and maintenance? It sounded like it was not. Um, certainly, they've done. I, they've made progress in securing the property. There was obviously a recent fire within the church, so it certainly is a continual issue that we are dealing with. So, uh, this is what the third or fourth fire on this project over the last ten years, and um, I think it would help us to know what the requirements were. Um, I was on the planning commission and I think on the, I'm, I'm sorry, on the city council when this came last time and planning commission before that, we gave very, very specific directions about compliance for security and maintenance of the project. I have concerns about that. Are you able to pull those up for us or have somebody in staff tell us what those are supposed to be? Yeah, I can pull that information up. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, there are a couple of things when I'm looking at the instructions for city council. Um, did the applicant submit a feasibility study by a nationally recognized firm mutually agreed upon by the city and the owner? The city doesn't have record that that has occurred yet. And that was supposed to come in by April 15th. And sure. then I'm looking at June 15th. Oh. No, no, that's not correct. Excuse me, you're you'll have a chance to answer. Sure. To I didn't know my I didn't know my uh, microphone was on. I'm speaking out loud. Uh, that it this is item number eight, and it says April fifteenth, twenty twenty two, and item number nine says uh, in terms of substantially complete milestone, substantially com complete shall mean certification by an architect that the primary aspects of the construction's plan, structural and mechanical, are at least 80% complete as consistent with industry standards. It, it looks to me from testimony from the city engineer that it doesn't, because we have no none of the um, mechanicals, that we haven't met the 80% complete standard. They've submitted a letter from an architect that said that the construction plans were 80% in accordance with the industry standards. Staff is evaluating the submittal that was is required by June 15th um, to determine uh, adequacy. But if none of the mechanical or civil was added, how does how does how do you review that? Well, I'm looking at the permits here. Um, they do submit structural calculations. They have a geotechnical report and Title 24 documents. So it doesn't that, standard. That, it that, that leaves out mechanical and electrical. Mm -hmm. And civil and landscape. So you would have, have to, to look so they, tell us that they're not 80% complete. Yeah, I'd have to look at the plans to see if those were included within the overall plan set. I don't have that quickly offhand. Thank you. Other questions from, um, from the commission? And can you answer um, no, they, Robert's they, question? 
I'm looking at the plans now. They do have um, they do have mechanical structural um, sheets included. 523 pages in the plan set. And can you explain the can uh, the city engineer comment on that? I, I think the plan? city engineer was referring to um, grading plans and utility and other uh, site. Maybe you can have the city engineer answer that. Yeah, um, I was only referring to the grading plans that were submitted. Um, grading plans that were submitted this week. Um, from our estimate, looks like they're maybe about 50% um, complete um, on whether or not our plan checkers would uh, accept them at this point. Um, but all of the other um, engineering conditions of approval required for this project um, have not been, you know, submitted. There's some of these are pretty significant, you know, um, parcel mergers easement dedications, right-of-way dedications, right-of-way vacations, encroachment agreements, um, all of those things require applications and plan check fees and submittals, and we haven't received any of those documents. Um, the document that we did receive, which was a water quality management plan and the grading plans were submitted without plan check fees. So we were trying to um, establish what those fees would be. Um, and let them know so that they could pay that. And my assistant today was in contact with their staff to try to let them know what all of those additional fees would be so that they could put together some checks for us. Commissioner Maruzzi, you had, you. I have a question for Mr. Priest. Shouldn't historic site preservation board review of impacts to the requested changes to the historical structures occur before? Planning Commission review of the proposed changes? Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner. I mean, they, they, they track separately. And so I think the question of sequencing is really more of a policy administrative question. Um, but there's no code requirement that HSPB has to opine on this before the Planning Commission does. If the Commission thinks that maybe that's a better sequencing, that's something that we could consider in the future, uh, but they do track separately. So therefore, if a, a, a certificate of appropriateness was not given uh, to the changes, what, what would happen then? Well, to the extent that those changes are required uh, to have a certificate of appropriateness, there, there would be an issue there without, you know, the, the, the matter could be uh, appealed to the city council at that point, and then the city council would have to decide the issue. Regarding the Historic Site Preservation Board's findings? Uh, about the Certificate of Appropriateness, yes. Uh, Mr. Newell, if you could clarify really quickly. I mean, the, one of the findings here is that there are no significant changes to the proposed project. So just please confirm that would Historic uh, the Board be reviewing these additional changes or not? Yes, they would as it, as it relates to the church. Okay, that, then it would be, you know, on a separate track with Historic Preservation Board, and then that is appealable to the council. So I can um, uh, respond to the questions on the submittal to the building. Um, they do have a whole package of structural, mechanical, plumbing, engineering. That was Thank you. Thank you. And can you answer um, Vice Chair Roberts' question regarding uh, whether the, they had met the requirements uh, regarding the maintenance of the property? I will pull that up next. Yes. Nation of the fires. Yeah, I, I don't have it right now, but I will pull it up. We can wait on that um, and open the public hearing. The applicant, if there are no other questions of staff, 
Uh, I do, actually, I do have one question. Um, how did you determine that there's a, an adequate reason for the delay? Uh, I, I have never, I don't understand how COVID could be a reason why an architect, they couldn't be ready with their submittals and they couldn't be at where they need to be right now uh, because of COVID. Uh, I, I don't understand uh, given that everything they needed to produce uh, wasn't wasn't construction. Why 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 you determined that COVID is an adequate reason for a delay? Um, it's one that we've used on other time extension requests. I think that was the basis for this recommendation, uh, as well as the the agreement that was established between the city and the applicant to allow until effectively January to issue permits. Based on the force majeure clause identified in the covenant agreement. Commissioner Roberts, you have something to say on that? Just another question. Is this, is our action going back to council or is it final right now? The time extension would be final unless appealed. Okay. Um, I'm, I'll need your help on something when we get further. I want to make a uh, recommendation for an additional action on this application, but we can get there once we open this up for right. uh, commissioner discussion. Right, we're not there yet. Um, we can have it. Let's open the public hearing. The applicant has 10 minutes. You will also have three minutes for rebuttal after members of the public speak. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Richard Weintraub, the manager of the ownership of the LLC, which is building the project. I have with me uh, Jake Jessen. He's down the hall, but he's my project manager on the project. And I've heard a few things tonight that I just wanted to, to clarify. Uh, the first is that we have lived by all aspects of the agreement to date. The unfortunate fire in the church actually took place with our contractor and workers on site. Uh, a homeless or unhoused person got into the property, snuck in, jumped through, or opened up a, a, a window. We have found multiple power tools on the property and went in there and lit a fire. But to be clear, we had security, security cameras, our contractor, and others on site. And that was just a very unfortunate incident that took place. And I don't know what else, if anything, could have been done to avoid it. We have worked tirelessly with the city's uh, enforcement department, building and safety. Uh, we have demolished all of the buildings that were required. And now um, building and safety has asked us to demolish other walls and other things on the property, which we are uh, just, even though it's not required in the agreement, uh, but to cooperate, we are going ahead and doing that. They're worried about people hiding behind some of these low walls. So we're taking care of that. They wanted some additional foliage uh, removed uh, from the property and trees that are still fully alive, but they want them cut down and removed. Large ficus and a couple of palm trees, we're doing that. Um, so I want to make that clear. Our plans that were submitted in civil in every project I've ever worked on always follows our application, but we submitted our application and our plans uh, at least 80% complete, including MEP, on the due date uh, with our fees. It took us a while to get the fees required by the city to tell us what to make the checks for, but they did. Uh, regarding the civil, uh, which like I said, always follows, uh, we only received what the fee would be. I'm not sure if it was even re received as of today, but we've turned things around very quickly. I know that David Newell can attest to that, that we've been extremely proactive with everything. Uh, Madam Chair, regarding your comment about the feasibility study needing to be turned in, uh, number eight, the only thing was that we shall commission a feasibility study report by a nationally recognized firm mutually agreed to by the city and owner by April 15th. 
The city, uh, we proposed CBRE, which is the largest firm in the country, I believe, to do a report like this that was approved by the city. And that, um, that uh, report is in, in process right now, but there was no requirement to turn it in. Um, the changes that we've asked for uh, have all been driven either by going through this process, a utility company or our operator, Auberge, which is nationally an internationally recognized hospitality management company, considered one of the top three in the United States, considered the top in California. And their team who is involved with us, our designers and our architects and our landscape architect, Victoria Pakshong from Place, have been very, very, very into minutia detail about what is required, what has changed in the world of hospitality, F and B, noise, mitigation uh, for events, uh, noise sound in the room, um, where to put the 74 rooms, which is why we ended up with the two rooms on the second floor, the need for some additional spa space based on circulation and the change in um, client requirements post COVID for needing more space in between each customer. All of those changes have come from our operator and they've been really firm with us on that these are, these are important. And this is our operator. We have a management agreement with them and this is what they've asked for. Uh, regarding the stuff that would affect the historical structure, aside from the fact that I have tremendous background in and, and, and I am highly respected in the world of uh, historic preservation uh, as evidenced by the recent um, deal I just did with USC, the LA Conservancy and uh, the Office of Historic Resources in the city of Los Angeles purchased the Frank Lloyd Wright, Rudolf Schindler, John Lautner, Freeman House in Hollywood. It's a front page article in the LA Times California section about that. But we've also hired Margarita Waller, uh, who's a renowned historian in um, historic renovation and preservation, who has worked with us through the entire process of every change we're making uh, to the tune of a six figure contract. She's also been working very closely as have we with Ken Lyon with all the changes that we've wanted to do step-by-step. Step. Recently, we were down at the site and walked the site again with uh, Ken and um, are not recommending or trying to push anything that doesn't receive the full support of ESA using the Secretary of Interior Standards. Keeping in mind that the churches, even prior to the recent fire, which happened in the uh, two-story area that was added on in the 1940s or 50s uh, was decimated by a fire in 2016, September 16, 2016. So really what we're doing is a, a renovation and a preservation of the church. And the things that we're doing there that are additive to what we're doing, which would be the small addition upstairs, is considered not significant. We've created enough articulation and landscape to deal with it according to Margarita and ESA, the uh, environmental clearance firm that she works with. And yes, we have to go through um, the historic board, but given the fact that uh, we have so far daylit everything with Ken Lyon and given that Margarita's reputation is impeccable, we anticipate that the board would go with those recommendations because they follow the Secretary of Interior standards for historic renovation. And for how to deal with a Class A historic structure. Um, the other things such as where the utilities go along the side on Barista, we have no say over that. Those were just dictated to us by the utility company. So we have no say over that. Um, I'm open to all questions. We're uh, just to give everyone the heads up, we are meeting with our uh, demolition people next Tuesday at site to go over and get started on all the things that were tagged with orange paint that are gonna be further removed, including the plants, trees, and addition, additional hardscape that the city wants uh, dealt with. And uh, that's what I have to say for now. Thank you. Are there members of the public who wish to speak? Mr. Newell, do we have anyone? No direct requests to staff. However, there are several member, members of the public on the call tonight. If you wish to speak, please unmute your microphone and or turn on your camera.
doesn't appear we have any other members who have requested to speak. Uh, can you stay? Uh, I, I'm not sure you want to. Use, you have three minutes of rebuttal, but if you don't want to use it, I'm sure we have some questions of you. Of course. Um, members of the commission, do you have questions of the applicant? Then I do. Um, I have a question regarding um, it's item number 11, but it's approved for the construction finance loan. I know you're not required to have that yet, but where are you with financing on this project? Well, if you had asked me that uh, 60 days ago, I would have told you that we were in pretty good shape with financing for the project. But in the last 60 days, uh, banks, uh, given the interest rate increase, the crash in the NASDAQ, uh, inflation that's out of control, banks are definitely taking a breather uh, right now over the last 60 days in wanting to issue construction financing, especially for a hotel that's costing about $1 million per room. So it's the most expensive hotel ever built in the Coachella Valley. That said, we do have strong interest uh, still, and we just have to see what the feds do, the Fed does over the next you know, 60 days, how much more they're going to continue to raise interest rates. Because what was a 3% start rate last year is probably a 6.5% start rate today on a, uh, on a hotel project. But we're out there with our investment banker and we're talking to all the right people on a regular basis. It takes up a lot of our time, which is fine. Other questions for the applicant? There being none, the matter is before the commission. Uh, general conversation, Commissioner Roberts, you indicated you wanted to speak. Yeah, I want to float something on this, and I need staff input on this, um, particularly from Mr. Priest. Um, with all due respect to Mr. Weintraub, um, this project has been dragging on for years and years and years, and it's a massive visual blight in our downtown, and it's not gotten better. Um, I'm at a place in my head where I fear that this property is being entitled and then potentially sold, and then we could start all over again. And every time this project comes before any of us, meaning any of the boards or council, it comes with changes and more requests for more extensions. I think we're at a point where I'd like to suggest that we apply for a receivership on this project. Now, I'd like to see that run concurrently with an extension of what he's requesting. It will take the city, it could take the city quite a while to get the receivership on this property, but I have great fear that we're not gonna really move ahead on this and that we need to take a bigger action. Um, it, I, it's not something that we can do from my understanding. It's something that we can only recommend to city council, but I'd like staff to comment on that. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission. I'm happy to comment on that one. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, you are correct, Commissioner Roberts, uh, that receivership would not be something that the commission would have the authority to place as a condition on this particular extension. They track separately. Uh, however, we can certainly uh, refer the commission serious concerns about this uh, through staff to the council. And uh, we can, uh, if, if the facts and the uh, circumstances warrant it, we can move forward with legal action to pursue a code enforcement receivership. I will note that you have to get a judge to sign off on that on the front end. Uh, and then uh, you can exercise control over the property to remedy code enforcement violations. Uh, but again, we could take the recommendation and then we could move it uh, toward uh, the staff and to the council in that way. So you, we would take your recommendation. In that case, could we re if, if the planning commission saw fit to make that recommendation to city council, rather than acting on their extension, could we send it back to council with the recommendation of applying for a receivership. 
if you were to approve the extension uh, and this were not appealed, uh, this would not be going to city council. But again, your recommendation can be made part of the public record. We can inform the council of this and we can get any necessary direction and, and see again where the facts and circumstances uh, warrant a receivership or some other form of code enforcement. But again, we can, we can note your concerns and we can address it appropriately. All right, thank you. I'd like to hear from um, my colleagues on this. Um, Commissioner Hurd. Your other thoughts, thank you. You're muted. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the request is premature. Uh, there's a number of things we don't know, and it won't impact the schedule. I mean, he has till May, 7, May of next year to get the one year extension. Is that not right? No, the, the, the entitlement is currently being told until the commission acts on this time extension. So effectively, once the commission acts, then it would extend through May of next year. If the commission chooses to deny the application, um, then most likely the applicant would appeal that to city council. Um, and then ultimately, if the council chose to deny it, then the entitlement is, is done. But if the council approves the one-year extension, then they have until January to comply with the um, covenant agreement. Okay, well, here's my, here's my concerns about what's missing. Uh, to uh, Commissioner Marucci's point is the HSPB approval. Uh, there's this uh, certificate of uh, compliance with certain historical standards that's outstanding from the consultant. Um, I'd like to see that. Um, I'd like to see the independent uh, evaluation of the submitted documents that they're 80% uh, complete. So um, those are at least three things that I think are missing before you know, I could determine that uh, it's in compliance. Uh, and then also, uh, I have doubts about the architectural changes. Um, just from that two-dimensional elevation drawing, it looks like the spa is impinging quite a bit on that uh, uh, historic part of the uh, church building. Uh, there was no three-dimensional drawing uh, contained, so it's sort of hard to tell, but I, I, just from that drawing alone, I would say that there are, to me, that uh, visually, there are some issues with uh, appropriateness. And up to this point, we didn't have a, um, a two-story building facing arenas, and now we do. And, you know, we've had issues with the uh, adjacent hotels about the density of this project in the past. And uh, it kind of opens up a can of worms to say, now we're going to backdoor a, a second floor piece to it that we uh, rejected, I think, in the past. So I'm not on board with the changes. I may be on board with the extension, but I think it's premature to ask until we have some more information. Other comments? Commissioner Miller? Yeah, it's more a, really a, a question for staff that I'd like to make now, given the discussion that's happened. Um, David, the changes that are proposed as part of this request with the second story addition and, um, and the trash enclosure and such, are those additions or changes, um, did they rise or would they rise to the level of requiring a formal revision or has, has that determination been made and, and you essentially um, have authorized these kind of changes to go forward as part of this extension request? So in staff's review of the requested changes, we looked at it as a part of the overall project itself. The overall project itself does have two-story buildings um, throughout this three and a half acre, over three and a half acre site. Um, so it's not um, out of the scope of what is already approved for the project. So in our review, it was minor relative to what the overall scope of the project is. 
And that was why we presented it as such to the planning commission. Ultimately, if the commission decides that these are not re minor relative to the overall scope of the project, then they would have to submit a formal revision and come back to the process. Uh, again, follow-up comment. Um, knowing that now, um, I am okay uh, if the other commissioners are with uh, deferring the changes, but I think it's important that we act on the extension request uh, based on the merits or not of, of the justification for the extension request. Um, the project, essentially, if it doesn't get an extension is dead. Um, and I don't think we as a city want that to be the case here. Um, and so I think we need to be cognizant of that um, position that we are in um, since the original uh, expiration date um, is two months in the past and they submitted their extension requests of be timely before that occurred. But this project needs to be extended uh, in order for all of these things that we're talking about to be moved forward. Commissioner Maruzzi, was that a, oh, me. Oh, Commissioner Irvin, comments? Was your hand raised? No, I, 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 don't, I don't have any comments. Mr. Uh, Priest, Madam, comments? Yeah, Madam Chair, if I could just make a suggestion. Um, I believe it, just for a second, Commissioner Roberts has his hand up in this item still before the commission. Um, I'd like to just float um, an action just to see um, where the planning commission is right now. I'd like to float a denial of this extension to send this back to council for their action, and I'd like to send it with a recommendation for an application for receivership. It doesn't mean the project will end. It, it does. That yeah. the city council can decide how to handle this. I, I frankly, again, with all respect to Mr. Weintraub, I, I suspect he's a, a great developer. I don't trust this project. Mm -hmm. It's gone on too long. It's so too we, much a mess. I, sir. So that is my motion. Okay. So Am I allowed to speak or am I not allowed to speak about such an outrageous request? This is this issue is before the commission right now. I may come back to you and let you speak, but at this point I want to hear from the commissioners. But I do have a three minute rebuttal, correct? Or no? I've already given that up. I gave I, him my right to a, a rebuttal? Close the public hearing. Oh, I was not aware. I thought a rebuttal was after. Who, who am I rebutting then? Okay. All right, thank you. Given you had no comments, I asked you to stay and I asked you if you wanted to use your rebuttal. Okay. I apologize, I misunderstood what you were saying, it's okay. Uh, so this question was posed by Commissioner Roberts. Uh, I'm wondering if there is a second to the motion that he's making. I would like before, I, uh, I'm sorry. I, keep I, discussing it, we can, we have a motion on the floor. So go ahead. Well, I would like to, I think Mr. Priest wanted to speak to, to a motion. Uh, I'd like to hear his suggestion. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yes, very quickly, if the commission, there, there was a concern expressed earlier, I believe by Commissioner Miller, about uh, if the commission denies the extension, uh, the entitlement is, is just terminated. Um, <clears throat> if the, the commission denies it this evening and the, the decision is timely appealed to the city council, then the entitlement would not be effectively gone. There would still be a continuing process within the city and then the council would make the final decision for the city on that. So uh, if, if you were to deny, it would not mean the end of the entitlement if it were appealed to council. And I, you know, it's likely that a denial tonight would be appealed. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Maruz, did anybody have their hand up? Uh, Commissioner Hirschbein. Um, I, I'd be willing to second uh, Vice Chair Roberts' proposal, but 
I'd like to add that uh, uh, along with the recommendation for receivership that uh, if it does get, uh, if, if our denial is overruled um, by council, that they at least um, send the design changes back to ARC and HSPB before they get approved. I don't, has Commissioner Roberts accepted that as a second? I don't accept that. My only concern is um, I'm trying to walk this through my head on how it would move forward. If council flipped our decision and then sent it back to um, the other boards, it would essentially just be buying more time for the applicant. Um, and maybe that's the best we can do. I agree with Commissioner Hirschbein. This wasn't fully baked even coming to us with respect to these changes. To, to come to us with an extension loaded with changes that I agree, I think were denied in the past with respect to the second floor. This, this project has gone for years and years and years of review. Um, I'm even a little bit surprised that the neighborhood's not here on these changes because they stood up heavily in the past for this. I think we've lost a generation of neighbors by this point. So I'm babbling here. I accept the changes um, to, to the action um, or to the motion, uh, but I do want it to go with a recommendation for receivership. The uh, Commissioner Maruzzi. Mr. Priest, is everything that's been suggested, is that acceptable in terms of a motion? You're on mute. You're still muted. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, so the motion would be a denial of the extension with a recommendation uh, that the city pursue a code enforcement receivership and a request that should the council <clears throat> grant the appeal and approve the extension that the uh, design changes be referred back to the ARC and the HSPB for their input. For their approval. For their approval. Uh, excuse me, city attorney. I have a question. So we, we have an incentive agreement with the city council that's already been executed. And as part of that, there was a milestone number that required us to extend our entitlements. But given that we already have an agreement that theoretically has extended them, so we have until October 15th to pull our building permit, uh, a date in January to begin commence construction. So the extension, as far as I'm understood, has theoretically already been processed. And this was a box checker uh, to go through the process to, to do it formally. But this agreement to extend the entitlements has already taken place, as far as our attorney understands. And to the point of the receivership, <clears throat> it we don't understand what would be going to receivership, given that this has already theoretically been worked through as part of our milestone agreement, but it absolutely would be a killer to the project. And that is an absolute fact. Okay, Madam Chair, do you mind if I respond briefly? I would like you to respond briefly to that. Uh, thank you. Um, what we have here is a land use hearing this evening. Uh, the Planning Commission is assessing whether they can make the findings for the extension. There's at least been a motion in a second indicating that they do not believe that they can. Um, that is a decision of the Planning Commission. It's not my place to tell them how to vote and how to make the findings. Uh, so that is their prerogative to make this decision this evening. If your concern is that you had other agreements with the city and this is inconsistent with those. You do have the right to appeal this to the city council and the city council was the body that approved those other agreements. And so you would be bringing the proceedings before the same body for a final determination. So there would be an ultimate decision on the project uh, at the city council level. But the Planning Commission is making their findings tonight, and they're entitled to make this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
just speaking to two things, I think we have two items we need to look at. Uh, one is, are the changes major? And therefore they would have to come back. And I, I think because they've been turned down before they are major. I'm, I'm not sure that these have been turned down. These have these changes, most of well, them have never been. Are we going to listen to the applicant dictate to us about this? I'm just trying to clarify facts because these have not well, been this is, this denied. Is for, this is for our staff and our chair to do, not you. Sorry. I understand. Uh, but if, uh, uh, whether they've been turned down or not, there are fairly significant changes to change that one corner. Uh, to a second story and to raise the envelope of the church, the, the, the envelope for the church. So I don't think those are minor changes. So I, I probably would not be able to say that I approve the changes. Um, and therefore they would have to, they would have to come back if city council agreed with that. I agree with turning this down and with the recommendation because, because I think this is a city council matter more than it's a planning commission matter. And I think that patience with this project has worn very thin. Uh, this is a project I loved the first time. I tolerated the second time and this time I don't have much patience for, especially after I heard the comments about financing. Um, if the applicant had said that, yes, you have financing lined up or you would self-finance this project, so we know it would go through, I don't know that we know this will go through. Um, so I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable. If what I would like, I wanna know if Mr. Roberts agrees that we don't agree to the changes. That yes, that would yes it would, I think that's um, been clarified. It would be it would be a denial on all aspects, um, and and be redirected back to the city council with two recommendations. One is to apply for a receivership, and one is if the council should decide to flip our decision and approve the extension, that it would go back. What is the process for? I'm sorry, I you know I can't function if we're going to be interrupted. Mr. Newell, can you turn off the microphones of the applicants? I've done that. Thank you. We'll deal with our attorneys. Good night. Uh, so, Madam Chair, I'd like to call the question. So, um, before the, we do the roll call, Madam Chair, I just want to clarify, in terms of the findings that were required to be made, um, it looks like, relative to the discussion um, on your motion, uh, specifically finding... Do you mind if I chime in here for a second, David? Please, Mr. Priest. I, I think with respect to this application, there's been adequate factual findings for perhaps the first two findings. I think findings three through seven, we've heard uh, competing information on that. And that's a uh, room where the Planning Commission is uh, exercising its judgment on the fact and circumstances of the case. And uh, I, I, I'll echo the comment that the chair made a few minutes ago about financing, for example. Uh, finding five requires that the applicant has demonstrated convincingly and clearly that the project will be some substantially underway within the extended period. If the financing testimony we've heard has concerned the commission, I think that calls finding five into question. Um, again, I'm not telling the Planning Commission how to rule on this, and you can look at the facts in two different ways, and that is your prerogative and your judgment. But I believe that each of those five last findings, we've heard facts in both ways. Thank you, Madam. As the maker of the motion, Mr. Roberts, do you concur that you can't make findings five through... Is it five? Three through five. Three through five? Yes that the basis of the motion is that we cannot make the findings of three through five on the staff report and the application, and that we send this back to city council for action with recommendations. 
So thank you. Your your motion is final and the applicant would have to appeal it before for it to go to city council. So we'll note those recommendations, um, assuming the applicant appeals it. Do you, need, do you need them restated, Mr. Newell? Or are you okay? The application yeah, receivership would be something that if they approve this project going forward, they would move forward simultaneously with a receivership? Um, that would be up for how the council does that, um, possibly delegated through the administration, through code enforcement. Um, you know, it doesn't follow a, a specific pattern. Obviously, the council would be considering it and then would uh, direct staff appropriately. Um, if they were to approve the project, I don't know if they would move forward with receivership or not. That will ultimately be their decision to make. Okay, so we have the motion, we have the finding, uh, and at this point, let's call the roll. Vice Chair Roberts? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Irvin? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Marozzi? Yes. I'm sorry, that was a yes or no? That was a yes. And Chairwoman? Yes. Motion for denial is approved. Thank you. We are now at item four. And what I to propose is a 10 minute break. Thank you. Uh, we will reconvene at uh, 7.50.
Thank you. Uh, moving along to new business, item 4A, uh, AOA Taurus Construction re requesting a variance to increase the maximum lot coverage from 35 to 42% and to decrease the front yard setback requirement from 15 to five feet. Um, and the side yard from 10 feet to six feet and the rear yard setback from 15 feet to 12 feet located at 555 North Sunrise Way. Staff report, please. Madam Chair, um, I would just like to note that while this is identified as 4A on the agenda, this is a public hearing. The city did provide notice in accordance with the public hearing requirements. Um, because this is a variance, uh, so we should hold this effectively as a public hearing item after staff report and planning commissioner questions. Thank you. We will um, Madam Chair, I'm concerned though, because it went out, because it was noticed, as new business rather than a public hearing, we could have a problem. I would Mr. Priest comment on that. If um, there were people who wanted to challenge this, but didn't think they had the ability. Um, certainly, I'm happy to address that. Mr. Newell, just clarify one point for me. The notices that were published and went out by mail, uh, those did indicate a public hearing. Correct. I believe that this can move forward. Uh, this has been placed on an appropriate Brown Act duly agendized item here. It meets those requirements. Those within the notice area and through publication did receive a proper notice of public hearing. So I believe this can proceed forward. This is just a mere technicality. I would ask that you uh, just um, move it to public hearings and uh, you can proceed. But adequate notice has been given. Thank you. Staff report, please. Hello. <laughs> um, so my applicant is requesting a variance to build a modest sized house five feet from the front property line and to increase the maximum lot coverage from 35% to 42%. Um, on your screen, you see an aerial of um, North Sunrise, part of North Sunrise Way. Um, the house, the project site in question is surrounded by um, developed um, single family homes. So I just like to explain the, the, the variance request. So this is the last home on this block, aside from the, the, the one at the corner that belongs to Desert Water Agency um, that is vacant. Um, Sunrise Way does have a right-of-way dedication um, from center line of the street that measures 50 feet in both directions. So what that does is that pushes um, the yellow line here that you see on the screen is the current property line it pushes that property line further into the lot, 20 feet, um, making the lot uh, much smaller in size. So the applicant now has to base his um, front, lot, front yard setback from this new property line, um, pushing that back to where approximately where the red line sits. Um, again, reducing the size of buildable area and um, shrinking the lot significantly. So the applicant is asking for variance to build five feet from that um, the blue the the new revised property line um, to what you see right there. So that's um, what they're proposing. That's what the variance is requesting. Um, this is what the uh, proposed the surrendering of what the proposed uh, house will look like once complete. And just to provide you some more context, this is the lot now. It is vacant. Um, it's not well taken care of, and it is surrounded by uh, existing single family homes. You could see at the bottom picture that those homes were built um, right up to the curb, it seems like. So um, after talking to engineering, these homes were built so long ago that the right of way dedication didn't apply to them at the time they were built. Um, but now uh, this lot, it is applied and that's the reason of the variance. And just to provide you a little bit more context, this is an aerial of um, the adjacent homes. The applicant is not asking to build um, 
basically that I'm sorry, the applicant is asking to build uh, basically in line with what you see here. So they're not asking for any special favors other than to build their single family home. The applicant, um, I'm sorry, so staff does recommend approval um, subject to the conditions uh, in the report and the applicant is available to speak. They just do not have a camera. Uh, are there questions for staff commission, Vice Chair Roberts? And then- um, Thank you, Chair. Um, so Alex, um, can you bring that um, aerial back? Um, the one thing that would help me if it exists is to show the footprint of the house in the aerial so we can see how its requests would relate to the other houses. Mm -hmm. That's my first question. Um, we're showing it, you know, I've, I've, I've poured through these drawings and it shows the part, it shows the house on its site, but it doesn't show it in relationship to the other houses on the street. And so I can't really get a sense of how this house is going to stand out, if it's gonna stand out differently. And for me, that's important to know. My second question of staff is, will we be setting a precedent that by granting this, uh, which I initially don't have a problem with, but will we be setting a precedent that we'll regret later? And if not, and that these requests are specific just to this property, because it in itself is an anomaly. Can someone explain that to me? So staff does believe that this wouldn't set a precedent. This is the only lot that's left um, aside from the desert agency lot uh, on the corner. And um, these lots, I'm sorry, these the developed houses that you see on the screen now do sit approximately 25 feet back from the, the face of curb. So, um, I agree, it would help to have the house shown in relation to other homes, but it's not setting a precedent. Um, so you can't show that. You There's nothing that shows the house on the parcel in an aerial or a plan view compared That's to it. the other ones? No, unfortunately not. We don't have that plan. Okay. Um, okay, so your explanation about this not being an anomaly, you're saying because it's, this undersized lot. I'm just concerned that if we grant this, we're going to have, you know, we could have a problem with other undersized lots coming in and the houses may not fit as well. Um, but I'll, I'll sit with that while others ask questions. Commissioner Hirschbein. Uh, in terms of the um, lot coverage request, does that percentage uh, of 42% exclude the area that's in the uh, highway dedication? Or how does that work? I mean, why would, what's their justification? I understand this one because all the other houses are in line with this proposal and therefore I don't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can visualize that that house in line with these other houses. But but what about the lot coverage? That one, uh, does that tie into this dedication area or it's or or not? It does not. Okay. So the third 42 percent goes all the way to the curb. Yes. Okay. And it's just a wish. They just wanted it bigger. The house? Well, the cover the lot coverage. Yeah, because the house that they're proposing, um, essentially it just comes out to 42%. And is that sort of with an administrative uh, margin of, of change or, or is that something that's significant? It would, it's, it's, uh, it would require the full variance, not done administratively. Okay. Are there other questions? I have, I have one, does this, and this may be for the engineering department. Does this, uh, can they still, uh, they have the, the 25 foot setback to, uh, for the potential to widen North Sunrise Way. Could they still do that? Or would this stop the city from being able to widen North Sunrise Way? Um, no, I think they would still be able to do that. Um, what this would be able to give the city is the ability to actually, um, 
put in the, the required sidewalks along Sunrise. Right now, if we wanted to continue our sidewalk program, which we've been doing down Sunrise Way, um, in this particular block and the block north of it, um, we wouldn't be able to at this time because all of the right of way or all of the property lines are essentially at the curb. And probably when Sunrise Way was reestablished or um, given a different street designation, the right of way wasn't obtained at that time. So um, the street widening itself is okay where it is now, um, but this would give us the ability to put in sidewalks and the required ADA clearances in the future. Other questions for staff? Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yeah, just to clarify, I think from Alex, uh, regarding the question from Commissioner Hirschbein, I think, um, the lot coverage as well as the front setback is all taken from the new right-of-way line, the new, essentially, the, the future property line, correct? No. In other words, the 42% is based on the now reduced lot size, is it not? Um, I'll double check, but I want to say it was it was taken from the... Uh, before it got, um, I don't, okay, yeah, double check oh, that. Yes, I yes. Sorry, I would. I just got confirmation that yes, it's from the new line. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. could you go back to those lines you drew on, on in your report? Okay. So, how big is the four? What is it? Forty two percent of of the new lot. And and show me where that is from this blue line all the way down here. Okay, well, that was my question. Okay, Sorry. got it. Okay, yeah. got it. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. Are there any more questions? Seeing none, the public hearing is open. The applicant has 10 minutes. My applicant should be there. Is Vera Schmitchik here? I should, sorry, Schmitchik here? Alex and Esther, it is your turn to speak. I believe, well, they are for sure here. Alex Torres? Yes. Um, I might be having, they might be having trouble with their mic. If I call them, can I have them on my speaker? Okay. Give me one second. Yeah. Um, Alex, I've got the application open. I can call them. Okay. Hi, yes, we can hear you. Sorry about that. I just couldn't hear you. We could hear you, but I can hear you. So, yeah, you have 10 minutes to speak, and I'll, might, I'll mute your. Uh, the only thing that I think that 42% that was going to, uh, it was that 42% was because we were getting that extra footage on the back side of the, uh, the property, not the front side. Okay. Do you have any other comments for the planning commission? Would you would you stay on the line? Uh, is, are there any members of the public who wish to speak? Did 
David, could you repeat his comment? I couldn't understand it. Uh, what he said was the reason the lot coverage is uh, is what it, it's showing at 42.8% is because they have additional space towards the rear of the lot. Are there any questions of the applicant? Does the applicant have anything else to say? The matter is before the commission. Are there any general comments? Seeing none, I would take a motion. Commissioner uh, Chair Miller. Yeah, my only general comment was, um, I think given the right of way taking here, um, I think the justification for the front setback and the side setback variances in the uh, lot coverage ranches are certainly justified. Um, this is a 2200 square foot house, which is in line with the general size of other houses along Sunrise and in uh, the movie Colony East. So I'm generally supportive of this. Is that a motion? I can certainly make a motion, although I, I saw Commissioner Hirschbein had his hand up as well. Commissioner Hirschbein, do you have comments? Yeah, you go ahead and I'll second it. Okay, I will make a motion to approve the variances for lot coverage and setbacks uh, for this property at 555 North Sunrise Way, subject to the conditions. Second. Any comments? I, I would suggest a, a friendly amendment to include in the resolution the maximum permissible lot coverage that statistics was left out and it should be, sounds like 42.8, so 43% rather than being silent on it. Certainly accept that. Commissioner Hirschbein, do you accept that? Yes. <clears throat> Can we call the roll please? Miller? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Leon? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner Marosi? Yes. Vice Chair Robert? Yes. Chair Womack? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Uh, moving along, we have a discussion item. Um, the For O2 Architecture representing Yun Kim, owner for a proposed mixed use development consisting of a hotel retail and 138 residential development to be used for short and long-term rental on a 4.6 acre site located at 2232 North Palm Canyon Drive. Staff report, please. Madam Chair, um, if I might interrupt, I own property within the sphere of influence, so I will recuse and leave the meeting at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Womack and members of the Planning Commission. So uh, before I proceed with my staff report, if I may just uh, share the screen with you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Ah, okay. All right. So the this item is is, is actually part of the uh, plan development district, uh, the new um, review and approval process for plan development district applications. So, as you may recall, when the uh, zoning ordinance was um, amended a few, uh, few months back. Uh, the the uh, plan development district application review process was changed to uh, include that a pre app be submitted, an outreach meeting uh, be held at the neighborhood uh, where the subject site is located, and then a discussion be held at the planning commission level before a formal application is submitted. So this is the uh, third um, step of that process. 
the application was submitted, staff reviewed it, provided comments to the applicant, an outreach meeting was held at the site, and that uh, the report of that outreach meeting was included in your staff report. So the, the um, item before you tonight, again, is just for discussions only. There are no decisions to be made. Uh, you will be providing comments both to the applicant and staff and then given directions. And um, staff will be re-emphasizing that the, uh, the discussion will be focused on the proposed use itself. And so the use as proposed by the applicant is a concept where um, it is a mixed use development that will consist of hotel, uh, residential development, and some aspects of uh, commercial and retail. There were a few issues that staff identified and that um, were um, uh, listed in the staff report. Number one, uh, the applicant is uh, proposing to have a hotel and apartment complex that will have uh, short-term and long-term uh, rental. But that in itself is an issue uh, in that it, it's a conflict with the Section 5.25.075 of the Municipal Code uh, that uh, details and talks about vacation rentals. And secondly, um, if it's going to be submitted as a planned development district application, public benefits were supposed to be identified, but none was identified in this application. So now I'm just going to go and um, introduce the, um, the proposed use to you, and then we can go back and discuss those issues that I just listed. So this is the area in question. It is approximately 4.6 acres. This is just the overall uh, area where it is located. It is um, located specifically at 2230 North Palm Kenya, uh, Palm Kenya Drive. And it is um, surrounded by um, partially and mostly developed um, uh, uses. So this is where it is. Now, this shows uh, just the zoning designations. The property itself is made up of uh, four um, or five different parcels, but all with the split zoning designation. It is uh, commercial on the front side of uh, North Palm Canyon, and to the rear, they are all um, R2, that, which is multi-family uh, uh, residential development. Although the proposed use, which is mixed use, is uh, permitted by the two designations. And, and that also applies to the general plan designation, which is mixed use. And this is just a layout. Um, the site itself is surrounded or is bordered by North Palm Canyon to the west and Via Oliveira um, to the north and to the south. There are some development to the side of it. And then to the east is um, Zanjero Street. The layout calls for um, a two-story building on the front side that will have 10 hotel rooms at the top. And at the bottom, there will be some commercial spaces, the lobby and a coffee shop and a fitness center will be located at the bottom uh, of the two-story building fronting North Palm Canyon uh, Drive. And then to the back of it will be eight different uh, structures, all two-story um, in mass. And we have uh, um, up to 16 units per building uh, that will con uh, consist of studios, one bedroom and two bedroom apartments. So this is the overall site layout as being proposed. And this is just um, the um, sections of the first, the, the drawing on the, at the top shows the ground floor of the hotel that will have um, the, uh, the lobby, the office area, and then some retail offices. And then the top floor, we have 10 hotel units. And this is just um, the site uh, section has been proposed. And all these, um, all these exhibits are contained in the exhibit that staff has provided to the commission. These are further um, sections of the plan. And as I said, they are two-story building. And these are the floor plans. So the one to, to, to the left side of the screen uh, is the ground floor. And then this, uh, the one to the right of the screen uh, will be the second floor of the buildings. 
These are the elevations um, and um, colors of the proposed buildings. So I wouldn't want to waste too much of your time on the um, design itself at this point, as um, we at staff level did provide comments to the applicant. However, the, the use itself is what I want the commission to give uh, directions on. It is going to be, it is proposed as a mixed use development, again, that will consist of a, a hotel use and apartment rental. The applicant would definitely uh, speak more on that concept and then um, questions be asked. This is the, these are the, um, uh, the perspective drawn renderings of the proposed um, structures. And again, this is just a conceptual landscape plan as provided. Again, this is a pre-app, so there are no detailed um, drawings or renderings to be really shared at this point, other than this one that I've just shared with you. So again, the recommendation to planning commission tonight will be to provide comments and directions again to applicants and staff, as there are no formal actions that are required for pre-applications. It is a study session, but I believe the applicants are uh, present to uh, give you more uh, details on the proposed concept and the use. And uh, that will conclude the staff report. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have questions or can we go to the applicant's presentation and then come back to comments from the commission? Just real quick, Madam Chair. Yes. There was some mention of vacation rental, uh, some issue. Is that right? What, what was Correct. That? So, yeah, as I mentioned, um, section five, uh, or, yeah, point uh, two five of the municipal code did, uh, does not provide for vacation rentals in an apartment complex in a multi family residential development. And that was that concern was uh, initially mentioned to the applicant. Um, I don't know of a mechanism with which we can overcome that challenge. Uh, perhaps the applicant can speak more to that. So I'm just quoting what the municipal ordinance uh, code says. The applicant had articulated uh, an interest in, in having a vacation rental use. Could you please repeat that question? Yeah, I mean, you're saying that, that the applicant had brought this up and now we should address the applicant with whether or not this is going to be a vacation rental? Well, it'd be good to hear it from you again from the commission, but I'm quoting what the municipal code says in the uh, in, uh, vacation rental section of the municipal code. All right, thank you. Can I just interject? The uh, city council, I'm not sure what year, uh, determined that you, they would not allow vacation rentals in apartment buildings. Uh, they're allowed in condos, but not in apartment buildings. Um, and so I, that's, and, and that's been codified, uh, by, the, by the city. So that, that issue is before us. Um, and I believe, am I correct that the application says that the applicant is interested in holding the hotel, but um, selling off the apartment buildings, the separate apartment buildings to different investors. That's correct, Madam Chair. So that's, that's what's before us. Commissioner Miller has his hand up. Yeah, question I think for staff, um, just to clarify in my mind, um, Edward, the definition, and I apologize for not having time to look this up ahead of time, the definition of hotel versus multifamily apartment, is it based on the length of stay? In other words, does the apartment say for 30 days or longer and hotel is 30 days or less? Or what, I guess the, the root of my question is what's stopping them from coming in and asking for a hotel over the entire site, which would obviously allow short-term rental, um, and then just renting some of them out for six months? Yeah, that is possible, uh, but then that's not the description that has been provided to staff. Can yeah, Edward, may I interject? So can, I, can I just finish my response to the commission? Sure. And then we can go from there. Yes, sir. And that's why I mentioned earlier that the, uh, that the applicants are here, they probably could provide more clarification, but based on the project description, and, and that's also contained in the justification letter, that is the uh, letter that's um, 
attached to your staff memo, you see that's um, going by that description. So, but but certainly they could do what the commissioner just mentioned. They can decide to uh, use the whole site for hotel, but that's not what they proposed. That okay. would also require require a plan development district. Can you explain Correct. why a plan development district is required here? I'm, I'm yeah, I'm I'm suspecting that's the reason why they want to go through uh, the PDD process. But I'm not sure if the PDD can be used to uh, use of the uh, provisions of the municipal code. This no. is something, Madam Chair, if I can chime in just for a second. Um, this is something that I would, uh, you know, we would have to analyze in more detail once we receive the formal application. It is possible that in addition to a PDD and other discretionary land use entitlements that would create effectively specialized zoning for this project, uh, we may have to look at possibly drafting an exemption in Title V of the code that has the business regulations about vacation rentals, as Mr. Robertson alluded to earlier. Uh, so there may be a number of legislative entitlements that are required to, to get this project into compliance with code. Um, I, I have that one question for uh, Edward, which was what requires a PDD with this? Uh, is it because they don't have a commercial use in the entire commercial zone? Or is it because of the height of the buildings and the density of the buildings that we would need a PDD? I, I just want to know why why staff thinks that if we if we were in favor of this, a PDD was needed. So to be very clear, Madam Chair, they do meet uh, all the development standards actually. So it is because of the use that I'm, and Mr. Mr. when uh, Mr. Uh, Lance O'Donnell speaks, he probably clarified that further. But in, in our initial dis, uh, discussions with the applicant, we, we didn't think that uh, a PDD was necessary uh, because they do meet uh, all the development standards. I'm suspecting that it is because of the use that was mentioned to them at the initial stage that that was in conflict with the uh, with Title Five of the Municipal Code that they are uh, proposing a plan development district application. And just as an additional question, we approved the Bose Hotel uh, years ago, which has something like this, but that is the entire property is designated as a hotel, although they may uh, they may have set up an apartment like situation am i correct that's correct and i'm i'm also thinking that was prior to the changing of the municipal code um if my memory serves me well but you're right uh so no. madam chair the only thing i'd mention is if you're doing residential under the mixed use cap classification you're limited to 15 dwelling units per acre what they're proposing is up to 30 dwelling units per acre which is permissible under a plan development district in the general plan um, for this property. So that is why a PD is required because they are uh, proposing to operate buildings as residences that are exceed, that basically necessitate a plan development district. Thank you. Uh, there being, I, am I seeing no other hands? Excuse um, me, I had a question for staff. Um, in terms of uh, their uh, desire to possibly sell off some of the existing multi-unit buildings, wouldn't they have to um, subdivide the lot, condoize it or subdivide it in some fashion to be able to do that? They could have a condo map and be able to sell. So um, if Rick is still um, with us, he can definitely chime in on that. But my understanding is that it could be um, they could have a a condo map and be able to sell. But then if it is classified as apartments, that might call that into question. So we may have to. 
they, right. they, I, I, could, I could say that they, they certainly couldn't sell them off as individual lots without subdividing them. Correct. Whether there would be some sort of arrangement, you know, corporate sale, uh, air, you know, subdivision of airspace similar to a condo where they could do something like that, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you without further information. Um, but it was something we would have to look at in more detail once we receive a formal application. Thank you. I, I can't see everybody. So if there are questions, speak up. Yeah, Chair, Chair I have a question. Um, do we know what percentage of the, uh, the property is going to be dedicated to the vacation rentals? Mm, I know I don't have that figure. So perhaps the applicant can speak to that. Okay, I'll save the question for the other. If we can bring the applicant for, oh, Commissioner Land. Uh, the follow up question that I have is uh, could we set a limit of the percentage of the, of the project or the number of units that could be used for short term vacation rentals and the number that needed to be dedicated to long term residences? Again, this is just a pre, pre uh, preliminary application discussion. Those those will be that will be part of the comments that you provide to staff, and we can do more um, um, research and analysis into that. And then, as the city attorney mentioned, once the formal application is submitted, we might be able to provide you more um, information on that question. I, I think. Uh either through the PDD, which is ultimately a legislative act of the city council, uh, as well as uh, possibly an amendment to uh, Title V, the, uh, the business regulations pertaining to vacation rentals, uh, the appropriate language could be adopted uh, that would allow a limitation, you know, allow a certain amount, but subject to a limitation. I think that's ultimately a legislative call of the city to make. It would just be a meth means of how we would end up codifying that. Thank you. Uh, can I turn this over to the applicant for a presentation? I would like to. So, Mr. O'Donnell, um, you're on. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Commission. And Edward, thank you for the staff report. And Dave, thank you for chiming in with some additional information on the PDD. Uh, Edward, can we go to the diagram that shows the site plan. Maybe not that one, that one but yeah, there we go. Um, so currently we're thinking about this project as a hotel and we're, we want to get it entitled as a hotel. There's a, an operator that's interested in it at the moment. Um, there was initial discussions that uh, this would be apartments, um, but we've designed this entire project to condominium standards. So our sound transmission levels, the durability, the things that we're, we're baking into the design of this are would be for a for sale product. Um, but currently we're pursuing a hotel and we do have somebody who's interested in running the entire property as a hotel. If in the future, that operator cease to operate it as a hotel. There would be a subdivision map that um, would essentially break this into nine separate parcels. And it's easily done. As you look at the plan, you see that each of the eight buildings have space between each of them. And, and we can break this into different parcels. And there could potentially be um, a building owner with uh, 16 tenants or any combination of that. But so as we see it at the moment, uh, we're designing it as a hotel with the amenities of a hotel. The public benefits and the interface with the public. Edward, if you can go to that last plan that you went to, the site plan that's a little more, a little more busy and a little more, yeah. What we're doing at the street frontage along Palm Canyon is we have a combination of commercial spaces there. That central space, um, halfway between kind of right where it says Palm and Canyon, if you just go east, you go to the right, there's a building in there. Yeah, that building there. 
that's intended to be a coffee shop that would transition in the evening to a bar. And that's fully open to the public, as are all of these spaces, those little green Pac-Men that are back behind the front buildings. Those are open space. So those are, um, there's a, there's turf back there. It's probably going to be artificial turf. There's trees, there's benches. That whole area is a public interface into the interior of the courtyard of the main building. So we have this long courtyard that extends from the west all the way through the project. And then there's these fingers that translate through the project um, north-south. Each of the buildings have their own internal courtyard. So they're designed, they're accessed internally. So the 16 uh, units in each building have their own internal courtyards. They have a private courtyard, private entry courtyard internally. And then all of those units have an outward facing balcony. If it's on the ground floor, it's a deck. If it's on the second floor, it's a balcony. So they all have indoor outdoor relationships to uh, sky ventilation and views, um, creating this interplay of these eight units that are you know, loosely held together by these courtyards. The site in itself has a, a couple of challenges. One is um, it's somewhat irregular in configuration, just the way that the, the parcels were acquired. Um, but at the northwest corner to the south east corner, the site drops 20 feet. Along Palm Canyon, the site drops approximately 10 feet. So, Edward, if you can go to the overall ed elevations, each of the units along Palm Canyon are, yeah, probably not that one. Uh, keep going, keep going. Maybe just the straight elevations, please. This one? Yeah, next one, this one. So what you see in that top illustration from left to right is each of these hotel units that are sitting on top of the commercial, the blue spaces at the lower level are those, um, is, the, is the view corridors into those courtyards. And so we have commercial at the ground floor, we have these 10 units up above, and each one of those are stepping one foot um, as one goes from north to south along Palm Canyon. So it has this gentle articulation along the street with the roof scalloped um, and then dropping a foot. And then the buildings on the interior also are dropping um, as they head eastward. So the site uh, is being accommodated both from um, somebody circulating around or disabled access through just this gentle sloping across the entire site. The lower view here shows the internal space in the courtyard. So these, these are essentially sections through the center of the space. And so there's um, access balconies for the second floor units. There's a central gathering space in the building. And then there's stairs leading up to um, the, the units up above. So there's kind of a, a repetitive um, kit of parts here, if you will, of how we put these buildings together in a way that addresses the this, this dropping of the site. Um, again, if I think about some of the questions that came up, uh, Dave, Dave Newell hit it right on the head. The reason we were, were um, utilizing the PDD is, is the density. The greatest density we could get to um, under the split zone by, and we could, we would have to have done a CUP and um, put everything under one type of zone or use the mixed use zone, but the, the greatest density we could get to would be 15 units to the acre, and we're proposing 30 units to the acre. We're still maintaining, because of the two-story and the, the compactness of the design and the circulation around the, the perimeter, um, Edward, if you can go back to the overall site plan. Thank you. We, we still have 54% open space. So we've got a great deal of open space, which is, you know, when I was on architectural advisory, it was always that 
the issue of the PDD and trying to come in with too much density. So we're we're above uh, the required 50% density um, open space, and um, we're 30 units of the acre, which were allowed by under the, the PDD. So we think it's a really good project. Um, it certainly up in this area. It addresses the issue of sun and wind. We have you know a great deal of of wind blowing essentially uh, aligned with North Palm Canyon. So it's blowing out of the Northwest. The central courtyards protect the amenity spaces, the internal courtyards on the buildings protect the owners um, entering the buildings. And there's always a sheltered uh, place to retreat. The, again, the perimeter, we have covered parking. We're putting solar um, parking covers over all the parking. We hope to get to almost a, a net zero energy balance with the design, with the carport um, solar and some additional solar that's uh, uh, potentially going on some of the buildings. And if there's you know any questions that things that I've missed, I'm, I'm you know happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Um, why don't I open this up to comments? Possibly we could take the so I could see the group and people have their own drawings. Um, if we could take this down and then open it up to comments and questions. Starting with um, Commissioner Irvin. Um, I uh, listened to the gentleman speak. Um, did you say the benefit of for the city was a bar? Is that the only benefit that you have that, that you are proposing for the city? Well, we have we're, we're proposing commercial a commercial space which would be a coffee shop during the day that would uh, in the evening um, become a bar, and those the coffee shop has like um, the corridor down, downtown where, where coffee is a little further um, further south, there's a court back behind where folks, you know, lo local community members could bring their dogs and, and hang out in an open space courtyard. Um, there potentially could be uh, use of the amenities of the hotel. Um, you know, some of those things will develop as we, as we move forward, but, but initially the public benefit is to open up the entire ground floor um, as it fronts on North Palm Canyon to the public. And, um, okay, so basically the answer is yes, it, 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 the only thing that you have to offer for the city is uh, the coffee shop slash bar. Is that correct? And, and, the, and the mini park that's back behind the, the, the hangout area. It's back okay. behind the coffee shop. And so, so it really is a, a relaxation hangout spot and not, um, yeah, not, not a drive through Okay. And, and, and then, express your comments as comments or concerns you have or things you like, uh, but we're not making decisions on this right now. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not making a decision. I'm just asking the questions. And then also, um, for, so the what we have here in front of us with the uh, mixture of the apartments and the uh, the uh, hotels that's totally been scrapped. It's just uh, it's just a hotel now. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Elaine, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, I was originally from the description here intrigued uh, at the idea of. The, the mix of uses, I was a little bit curious about it, but I thought it held potential in particular because it would be really nice to get the residential component there. Um, the hotel component, I, I lose some of my enthusiasm for, uh, but here, here's for that part of town, if it is, um, indeed, to have a community benefit, I think it needs to be 
I, I would suggest that you consider that a certain percentage of the units be dedicated to uh, residential use rather than to the short-term rental or the hotel use. And that's going to require, they're, they're different. It seems easy to just say we could stick them all in the same place, but if it's, um, it, it would need to be designed on the interior such that it can truly be used for a longer term residence with greater, you know, closet space and, and more kitchen and, and more usable. I think my personal belief is in that part of town, um, having a nice, uh, small uh, and amenitized housing units would be an amenity. Be great to have some commercial beyond. I, I don't see that a bar, I personally don't see that a bar does anything um, as far as being a community use. Um, I don't know. At some point, I think <laughs> Palm Springs is going to be a little bit overbuilt for both hotel uses and for short term rentals. I don't know, maybe not the way it's going. It seems to. Uh, at this point, there seems to be quite an appetite for it. But I think for that part of town, um, it, it's possible that what would be a greater benefit to the community would be real, affordable, year in and year out, or you know, six months in and six months out of uh, rental leased housing. Uh, Commissioner Hirschbein. Uh, so we're just to give our opinion now, is that right? You're basically to give some sense of what your concerns are. What you'll Well, I don't have any. Um, I, I think it's an incredible project. I, I love the density. It's something we've been trying to get other developers to do and they insist on these small lot subdivisions where there's a two foot setback to the adjacent house. This, this is the exact site plan uh, that the city's crying out for. Th this is what we need. Um, and clearly we're moving into really, really uncertain economic territory in the near maybe mid and long term. We don't know where the economy is going. What this developer is looking for, I think from us, is some flexibility in how he operates these units moving forward. That's if he, he can even get financing at this point. I mean, we just heard this really experienced developer tell us it's gonna to be tough. And now, uh, I don't know what this developer's experience is, but it's at least gonna be that tough, if not tougher. And um, I, I think he deserves um, some leeway at this point with us. And um, if we want to hold, I, I think we, my feeling is we give him the most flexibility in terms of sales and, and or length of rentals that, that he, that would allow him to go forward with this project. Because regardless if it's overnight or, two weeks or six months or a year, it's a great project. And I, I want to see this project move forward. And I don't want to stifle it based on the length of time that somebody can inhabit one of these units. Uh, Commissioner Maruzzi. And I'm going to basically take one comment per person and then see if we can finish this up. Yeah. Uh... Uh, the public benefit component, though, is important to me because that was the whole long-term discu long discussion when this new ordinance for the PDDs was put together. That's always been an issue with plan development districts is the public benefit. I don't know, and maybe this is a question for staff, but if it's zoned for commercial, how can commercial use be considered a public benefit? So every commercial building that is built on uh, something zoned for commercial is a public benefit? So that strikes me as a little odd. The access to the courtyard in the center, I mean, isn't that going to be, I mean, the pool has to have a, a fence around it. And I mean, just the general public can wander around the property and sit around and sit and I don't understand how the courtyard area can be a public benefit. It looks like it would be useful for the people living there, but I don't see how it's a public benefit. And then the concept of a, 
what's now I guess you're calling coffee shops, but it's really it's like a you know it's like a coffee house, like a Starbucks or a coffee. Um, that also doubles as a bar. I guess we could think about it as being sufficient public benefit, but I'm not necessarily convinced of that. Yes, Madam Chair, um, just so the Planning Commission is aware, there's three items that the Plan Development District identifies as types of benefits, public benefits. One is affordable housing, the second is on-site public amenities, and the third is off-site improvements. Um, so it sounds like what the applicant is describing is probably the second of those three, the on-site public amenities. And it says the provision of on-site amenities, which will be available to or benefit the general public, um, such as parks and plazas, community open space dedication, community meeting rooms, civic facilities, daycare facilities, preservation of historic structures, preservation of natural features, public art or similar amenities. I'd like to find out then how the open courtyard, if it's truly open and all that, how it benefits the general public and not the residents per se or specifically. Commissioner Miller. Yeah. Um, I too share a concern about the degree of public benefit, I think, but um, one thing I wanted to, to comment on with the design is, I'm wondering if the architect slash developer looked at building over the driveways with the second floor, the second story, in other words, uh, building over the surface throats of your entry into the parking, with building um, to sort of uh, maximize the frontage of building on, on Palm Canyon, one thing. Um, and then um, I appreciate the, the sort of the view corridors in from Palm Canyon. Uh, one of them, uh, fourth, fourth unit from the south aligns pretty good with the uh, with the long axis of the open space, but that's where the concern over what is truly public and what is a benefit, I think, uh, rises. I'm sure that the public isn't going to be allowed to walk around the swimming pool, but are they going to be able to get on the property to a similar um, environment, which you described at the Coffee North, which is very nice, I agree to be able to walk through that, the uh, underside of the building and uh, emerge into that green space where you can feel comfortable whether you've bought coffee or not. I think that does rise to the level of a public benefit, but I wanna make sure it's big enough and inviting enough that it really fits that bill and is not just a, a nod to uh, to trying to, to, to make that requirement. Um, so those are kind of my basic, my basic two questions and concerns at this time. Um, mine are slightly different. Uh, one is I'm concerned about the feasibility. I, I love a nice development coming into the North Palm Springs area. And, um, I'll be receptive to anything that's attractive that goes in there. Uh, I am concerned about the feasibility of a hotel being built not in the downtown corridor uh, because it's been, you know, the, I think one of the few hotel, we've seen very few hotels in the recent years arrive in the Rowan be built after 20 some years of host hotels not being built. And we've seen several fail. So, in terms of the use, I've got that question. Uh, in terms of the vacation rentals, I wouldn't, uh, I have an issue with asking the city council to do something special to override a concern they had about vacation rentals in apartment buildings. I don't think, I don't think that um, that description of a use is appropriate. And I completely agree with staff, the concern that staff raised about that. Uh, I did vote for the Bose Hotel, which looked like these buildings, 
uh, and provided um, nice accommodations for families to come in and rent for a weekend or a week, uh, but that it has to be designated as a hotel to do that. Um, so I, I, I think in terms of our designations, we've got a hotel where you can do short-term rentals because that's what hotels do. And you've got apartments which, um, which are longer term housing situations. And I wouldn't necessarily, given the concerns that are in the city right now about saturation of short term, rent, of short -term rentals, uh, I don't know why I would ask the city council to make special provisions to allow this to happen here. Uh, be very thrilled if you did some of it as housing, either condos or or rental, especially rental. Uh, like the idea of the hotel concept, if it's a hundred percent hotel that you're putting forward, I think that that could be very, you know, if that can work in that neighborhood, um, very exciting. But we, um, if we do a PD that allows more density, I would prefer that more density come for, for, from, from some rentals on the property. I would just love to see some rentals. I think that would really help even if it's market rate rentals. Uh, but I think we need, we need rentals in this city. We need them desperately. So um, uh, no negatives on your design. Interesting, I like the idea of building over the, the entry so that you have more of a street presence. I think that's just in the design issue. I wouldn't have thought of it, but I always like the design elements that Commissioner Miller um, suggests in these kinds of discussions. Um, and we'd have to look at, if it came up, we'd have to look at real community benefits. Um, Coffee North is one if you could create Coffee North uh, meeting spaces. I'm sure people in that area, I think there's a dearth of any place where people can meet. Um, there, there are things that you can provide that would be community benefits, but I think before we get to community benefits, we have to get a, a project that one is feasible and one that works with the city ordinances. Um, so that's probably all I have to say, um, love your work, but, you know, I, I'd like to make sure that what you're doing is feasible. Other comments, is, is there any follow-up comments? Yeah, yeah, Chair, this is, uh, Charlie. I, I kind of just asked a question and didn't kind of, uh, make a comment or a recommendation. Um, I would also like to uh, somewhat echo some of the sentiments that you spoke of as well um, with the uh, as the aspect for the commercial aspect of it. Um, a furniture store would be something of interest. Uh, a bank has been uh, mentioned as well. Um, I know we have a food desert, but there's no way that that would be able to apply to that. Um, but just a couple of different things to take into consideration. Um, we have a couple of coffee houses around that area. Um, so I just wanted to mention that um, we definitely need housing. Um, so, you know, for me with the hotels, that's a little tough. Uh, housing has constantly been an issue uh, that has been a discussion and I would love, love to see housing. Uh, hopefully those comments are helpful to you and staff. They're pretty uh, disparate, but we'll give you a sense of where we're, what we're thinking. Yeah, we appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. We will um, be sitting with the applicants again, and, and hopefully you will see this back uh, before you in the very nearest future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, moving right along to planning commission reports, requests, and comments. Uh, Commissioner Maruzzi. 
Just do we have any update on the the Virgin Hotel, the, the condo complex that was going to be built where the Virgin was to be built? Is anything moving in that direction? Yeah, the ARC reviewed provisions to the um, to the project at their last meeting, so that was approved. But it's been in plan check for se for several months. So apparently, it's moving forward. Correct. Does it mean it's it has funding, or is it just the plans are being moved forward? Yeah. So I don't. We don't know that um, side of it, but it does. You know, it is going through the permit process. So. Um, yeah, it's still going forward. Interesting. I'll have to look into that some more. Thank you. Uh, I think there was one appeal that came in between our two meetings. Do you want to talk about the nightclub? Yep. So the city council on June 30th, um, held the planning commission's decision and denied the nightclub at 383 South Palm Canyon Drive. It was a 3-1 vote. What, which, which nightclub was that? Um, the Flagler nightclub. Oh, okay. It, I think city council, the two of the three votes turned it down because it was eight feet away from residential. Uh, and they felt that there was no way it could succeed. The police intervened that they thought there was no way they could control noise in, in that area either. I, I think I'm correct on that. That was, um, there was police concern about safety and noise. Who voted to uphold the appeal? Councilmember Woods, or to, to yeah, Councilmember Woods. Oh, he, no, to uphold, Oh, Councilman. The appeal, uh, yeah. Was, uh, Councilman Gardner was recused because her law firm, her former law firm was representing the neighborhood opposition. And um, I think the motion was made by Mayor Middleton, seconded by Councilmember Kors and supported by um, Councilwoman Holstage. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about tonight. Uh, I think part of that discussion, and we probably shouldn't have had it, I shouldn't have allowed it in front of the applicant, uh, really came out of surprise in terms of what the ordinance said. We had always been going forward, especially with Tower, Tower Market and the 7-Eleven before that, looking at percentage of space. I don't know if that's a continued concern, uh, but I think that the ordinance that it came from uh, or the ordinance that was crafted dealt with something different than what we had been working with for years in terms of percentage of liquor. Um, and it, uh, I, I don't know if, if anybody feels like that is still a concern that we could send to city council or send to staff for future revisions. Commissioner Hirschbein, you're- Yeah, I, I agree with you. I do too. I think we should be consistent and we would spend so much time on the tower market issue to now switch over to receipts. I, it just is it's inconsistent. I think we should stick with the square footage. Plus, it's so unenforceable. There's no way anybody in the city is going to ask for those receipts and then analyze them. No, we couldn't. It's do it just straightforward. You can look at the plan and you can see how much is allocated for liquor, unless they change it later. But we couldn't do it tonight. Is there a way to refer that issue to council just to let them know that we have a concern about how that change happened, or to refer it? To, um, I don't know if that's something that would come out of planning are aware those changes might occur in the future? So one thing that we, you know, what we did last year and ultimately was part of the code update this year was we changed the number from 50 to 25%. Um, 
And so we didn't change how we, how we you know, regulate alcohol sales. It was always per the, um, basically the sales receipts, the gross sales um, for a, a gas station. Um, but when we looked at the tower market, we started talking about floor area and what areas were devoted towards alcohol and what areas were devoted towards retail and other um, grocery items. So if that's something that we would like to um, bring forward as a text to minute, we can look at that. Um, I, th I, think, I think it would be useful to do that. The receipts, I think it's, it's probably is hard to enforce. It's not hard to enforce floor area. So what we might do is um, add it to our list of cleanup items and just call more attention to it um, as we get into that later this year. And um, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm not altogether comfortable with this discussion because it wasn't agendized and it's kind of leading into a bigger issue. I don't necessarily agree with what I'm hearing from um, other commissioners, and I'd like to have a discussion um, rather than so we have a cleanup do. issue, rather than you know pass it on to the city council without having a conversation. But I think to do that, we probably need to have an agendized discussion. That sounds fine. Uh, well, we can we can simply take this as a referral of the item to staff, and we can take it from there if you'd like. Uh, well, if if it, it because it's if it, not agendized, should we agendize it before we do a referral to staff? Um, well, if you'd like, yeah, we could agendize this for further discussion. Yes. Thank you. I'm confused what you mean uh, by uh, a referral to staff. Well, I, I, so I we guess need to give staff some direction. Okay. Um, if we want to have a more extended discussion on this, uh, we can certainly agendize this for a later meeting. Uh, I guess I was taking the position that you know, periodically staff does code updates anyway, and so we could include this and we would take this as just an expression of your concerns to look at this. And then ultimately when we bring code amendments back to the commissioner or the council, that will be in there. And then you could have that discussion at that time. But if you'd like to have that policy discussion sooner, we can certainly agendize it for the next meeting. Yeah, I'm good with having it uh, with the other um, cleanup items as long as it comes to us because I'm, I'm, I'm not confident that I agree or that I understand um, the, the merits that I'm hearing discussed and I might have a different opinion. So if as long as it comes back to us before it goes to city council. Yeah, that's the best. Like, that's the approach we take. The other approach would be if the commission wanted to uh, initiate proceedings by motion. And in that case, if there was a majority vote to initiate proceedings, we would, um, per our zone text amendment section in our code, we would do the investigation, we would provide the analysis and bring that back before the commission as a public hearing sooner than the, the annual update. Do we have any cases in the pipeline that, that uh, are going to uh, uh, where we'll need to have something established? No, mm -hmm. that's so not a, the only one. There's not a real hurry. No. I I would just hold this as a ask staff to look at it later, but not open it. Okay. You come back sooner. Um, planning director's report. <clears throat> um, so a couple of things real quick. The next meeting on July 27th, uh, wanted to confirm that we could start earlier for a study session item on the Bel Air Greens intent to convert application. I'm thinking maybe 3.30 if everyone is available at 3.30 or um, just because I, I'm expecting we'll have a lot of public comments. And we it wanna hold this. Item on the whole night because we could have enough public comments on that to take up the entire meeting. 
Yeah. And that's kind of the idea is that I don't want us to sit through two or three hours of public comments. I'd rather um, have public comments at 3.30 and then uh, initiate discussion um, with the presentation and the planning commission before we start the regular meeting. Can so I think 3.30 would be enough time. Can we do all of that in two hours? I think so. And if we need, if we, based on the number of public or number of requests we have to speak, we might limit public comment to two minutes. You are, you are permitted to set an outside limit of public comment, Madam Chair, if you uh, wish to do that. Um, that is a reasonable uh, limitation to manage the meeting. Um, that would be ultimately the call of either the chair if you want to pull the commissioners on that. And we we can make the limitation. We can limit it to two minutes for this. Yes, you can do that, and then you can also limit total time that you would be taking public comment. Why don't I um, discuss that with okay. Ms. Campbell, and we can set yeah. that. It's not something to be done on a on a standard basis, but under special circumstances where the meeting could end up going very long. Uh, you are entitled to set reasonable limits like that. We've uh, we certainly not had a meeting for a long time with a lot of public comment. So to allow some of it would be good. But why don't Mr. Newell and I figure out how we do that? Do we have a big agenda that night? Um, we've got... That item, a discussion on, tentatively, we have a discussion on the SB9 ordinance revisions and a three unit project. So it doesn't look like it's that big of an agenda at this point. Uh, I can make 3.30, can everybody else? Uh, Noel, can I um, reach you? Uh reach back out to you after I check the schedule to see if I can leave from my work a little early. Okay. Yeah, if Mr. Irvin can't, we might need to set a, set a separate evening for this. Okay. Thank you all. Great. Right. Thank Stay you. Cool. Good night. Bye, everyone.